Namaskar, good morning, bonjour. I would like to welcome you all to the webinar titled Remembering Sri Aurobindo, organized by the School of Foreign Languages, Indira Gandhi National Open University, in collaboration with Center for European Studies, University of Mumbai. Right in the beginning, I would like to request Professor Madhu Mathur, Director of SOFL, to deliver the welcome address. Good morning, bonjour. It's wonderful to be able to connect with you all this morning. And uh, I think that uh, Sri Aurobindo is such a valid uh, person to be talking about because he seems to have disappeared from mainstream discourse for some reason. And I am so happy that the two great uh, institutions together, IGNO and the Center for European Studies is together collaborating to be able to talk about Sri Aurobindo's thought and uh, his relevance in today's world. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all this morning. And I'm looking forward to uh, not just the keynote address, but also the deliberations which will follow later after the inaugural session. Now, why Sri Aurobindo? Why do we need to even talk about him? Why do we even need to think about him? Because it's been 150 years. So uh, perhaps it's time to revisit him. And uh, one of the things that has really struck me about this man, apart from his uh, revolutionary past and uh, his spiritual leanings, his uh, philosophizing, it is the way in which he asserts that the ego needs to be put aside because he keeps, he, he does talk about how in order to, to see, you have to, you have to stop being in the middle of the picture. So that is such a clear indication of where his thoughts are, how you need to be able to move away from the foreground in order to see the entire picture. And as teachers, for me, it is especially significant what he says about the teaching and the thought when he says that the the first principle of teaching is, is to understand that nothing can be taught and that true knowledge does not come from thinking. It is what you are, it is what you become. So I think as teachers, that is such a significant thought to hold on to and to go by. And uh, he also uh, does say that you know, it is only by making mistakes, it is only by stumbling that you become perfect or the world becomes perfect. And there is also a cautionary note when he says, you know, you better watch it when people are too indignantly righteous, because at some point, the things that they are opposing so vehemently are perhaps the ones that they will support equally vehemently. So that is a call for reason, for stability, for a kind of calmness to be able to analyze and to react. So Aurobindo, in so many different senses, has so much to convey to us if we can only see what he wants to say. So I am so happy to be able to, uh, to, to be a part of this uh, conference today. And I'd like to congratulate Dr. Dipandita Shivasta for putting it all together, for talking to all the scholars, for being able to bring them together on this one platform, even though it is virtually. And it is my great pleasure to be able to uh, welcome our pro vice chancellors, uh, Vice Chancellor, who will be joining us a little later, all those within IGNU and outside who are joining us, uh, not, not just from the regional centers, all the heads and uh, the heads of divisions and schools, but also those who have uh, joined this webinar because they, they would like to listen more to what Sri Aurobindo has to tell us in this day and age to be able to relate and to follow those principles today. And uh, I'd like to uh, thank those who have joined us as our keynote speaker, as our guests of honor, and uh, those who will then be delivering their lectures, uh, Professor Vidya Venkateshan, Jayanti Raviji, Professor uh, Sampadananda Mishra, Professor Michelle Adanino, and uh, Mansi Joshi, uh, Mansi Sar Joshi, sorry, who will uh, deliver the vote of thanks later on. So we have a formidable array of scholarship on the display today, and uh, I quite look forward to listening to all of you. So uh, with these words, I'd like to say welcome.
soon and thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Um, Sri Aurobindo, <clears throat> Sri Aurobindo, whom we in India often call Maharshi Aurobindo, was born on the 15th of August, 1872. On this year is his 150th birth anniversary. As you all know that the 15th of August is very important and very significant to all of India because of the most obvious reason that, reason that we officially broke away from the British colonial rule, a cause that Maharshi Aurobindo also excelled in the early phase of his life. Incidentally, India was independent in 1947 when Rishi Aurobindo turned 75. And this year, India is also turning 75. It's a sheer coincidence. The tale floated away in the sea. Whoever breathed it in was on the way to heaven, is a line that Dr. Dipanita Srivastava wrote in her book, An Anthology of Folk Tales from Francophone Africa. Dr. Srivastava also floated the idea to celebrate Maharshi Aurobindo's birth anniversary, and we have the opportunity to revisit the sea of treasures of Maharshi Aurobindo and the mother. Now, I would like to request Dr. Srivastava to set the framework of the webinar through her introduction, ma'am. Thank you, Tato. Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Nageshwar Rao, Guest of Honor, Dr. Jayanti S. Ravi, Secretary, Oroville Foundation. Distinguished speakers, Padmashree Professor Michel Danino, author and historian, visiting professor at IIT Gandhinagar. Professor Sampadanand Mishra, Dean Culture, Professor and Director, Center for Human Sciences, Rishihud University. Professor Vidya Venkateshan, Director, Center for European Studies, University of Mumbai. Pro Vice Chancellor, Professor Uma Kanjilal, Indira Gandhi National Open University. Professor Sumitra Kukriti, Pro Vice Chancellor, Indira Gandhi National Open University. Director, School of Foreign Languages, Professor Malti Mathur. All directors, heads of regional centers and divisions. All colleagues, dear students and participants. As India marks its 75th year of independence, this year, 2022, 15th of August, as Tato rightly said, marks simultaneously the 150th birth anniversary of the great saint philosopher, poet, scholar, literary critic, and yogi, Sri Aurobindo Ghosh, described often as the prophet of Indian nationalism. Over the last many decades, in fact, Sri Aurobindo's ideas and philosophy have inspired generations of followers in India as well as across the world, encouraging global studies centers of research who have contributed with valuable insights into Indian knowledge traditions, education, spiritualism, poetics, and notions of universal brotherhood. At this point, it is of great significance to mention that Sri Aurobindo's life and teachings have nurtured profound links with France and the French history in India. In 1910, facing charges of treason in the Alipur conspiracy case and hounded by the British police, Sri Aurobindo seeked refuge in Chandanagar first, followed by his final destination in South India in the small little town of Puducherry, all part of French India. Historians have in fact quoted, for the French, Sri Aurobindo was an honored political exile entitled to their protection in Pondicherry. August 15, 1947, the day India attained independence coincided with his 75th birthday. It was sheer justice of history for someone who tirelessly worked for this momentous event. The Agence France Presse 
AFP news agency had reported then. Sri Aurobindo, the most powerful Indian thinker, had granted audience to Maurice Schumann, special envoy of the French president, Paul Ramadier. It was said that during the meeting with Governor Barron and Schumann, Sri Aurobindo had declared fondly, France after India is the country for which I have the most fondness and respect. Rishi Aurobindo had long dreamed of establishing in Pondicherry a university that would be a permanent window and a meeting place between France and India. Eventually, the Sri Aurobindo International University Center, today the Sri Aurobindo International Center of Education took shape and has since remained a hub of excellence, promoting a new model of education with French language as the basis. It is said also, the Saint philosopher had not only mastered the language, taught it, but even read a good deal of French poetry in the original. He is known to have written extensively in French and even composed poetry in the language. The poet philosopher, having completed his schooling in England, was fluent in English and French, apart from numerous other European languages like German, Italian, Greek, and Spanish. He maintained that French came to him as a spontaneous memory and hinted he had had a former life in France. There are many remarks and short written pieces of his on French literature, and thought in general, as well as on France as a nation, including its history. We know well his famous writings on the French Revolution and some on 20th century politics as well. Another very crucial aspect to the works and philosophy of Sri Aurobindo was the arrival of Mira al Fasa, commonly known as Srima, the mother, who was a French lady who during a visit to Pondicherry was deeply impacted by the teachings of Sri Aurobindo and 1920 onwards chose to stay on in India, devoting herself to studying and promoting the teachings and philosophy of the great saint. In later years, she, she played a very crucial role in translating the vision of Sri Aurobindo by setting up of the Auroville in Pondicherry envisaged as a spiritual township based around the ideas of sustainable living and universal brotherhood. As university centers of study of the French language and European studies in India, we feel strongly that the time is ripe to shift the narrative slightly after all these years, to tilt the frame from studying the other to understanding ourselves through the prism of a supremely evolved model of thought and introspection. To introduce into our curriculum, India-specific perspectives, Francophone heritage from Sri Aurobindo Ashram, poetry, travelogues from followers and disciples of various nationalities, French, Swiss, Belgian, and many such others. As India enters the Amrit Kal, the new phase, this and many more initiatives need to find place in our French studies curriculum in the years to come. On this momentous occasion, for the first time ever, two major Indian universities and centers for the study of foreign languages and cultures the discipline of French at the School of Foreign Languages, IGNU, and the Center for European Studies, CES, University of Mumbai. Join hands to collaborate the birth anniversary, the 150th birth anniversary of this great figure whose life and teachings inspired and continue to inspire many across the world today. We feel privileged to embark on this journey and unfold the dialogue that would hopefully herald a critical aspect in Indo-French 
cultural studies in the days to come. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Sivastav. And as Dr. Sivastav just underlined that this program has been jointly organized with Center for European Studies, University of Mumbai, that also gives us the opportunity, or I would rather call it a fortune to have an erudite Dr. Vidya Venkatesan with us. Good morning, ma'am, especially to you. At times, it is better to borrow the words of somebody else to say things more beautifully. And I choose to quote His Excellency Emmanuel Lola, the present ambassador of France to India, what he says about Madame Venkatesan. He says, she is une passeuse de culture. Madame Venkatesan c'est depuis une décennie mobiliser un réseau d'auteurs de passionné du verbe et de la musicalité de l'homme. I'll just translate, a fairy woman of cultures, quote unquote, if you allow me, ma'am, to say that, a fairy woman of cultures, she excels the art of laying out the network of authors, of passionate people of letters, and of musicality of languages. His Excellency was referring to the prestigious journal Synergy and that Professor Venkatesan runs as the editor in chief for over a decade now. She is the head of the Department of French and the director of Center for European Studies, University of Mumbai, author, translator, and visiting faculty to many European universities. She has a Dr. S. Lett from Université de Paris 3, Sorbonne, Nouvelle Sorbonne. She is the recipient of three international awards by the Republic of France and the Republic of Italy. Now, may I request, ma'am, you to pronounce your opening remarks. If I could just take a moment, I see that our Vice Chancellor has joined us. So uh, good morning, sir, and welcome. Yes, please. What is the invitation? Respected Vice Chancellor Ignu Professor Rao, Pro Vice Chancellor Ignu Professor Kukreti, Director School of Foreign Languages Professor Mathur, Dr. Jayanti Ravi Secretary Oroville Foundation, Dr. Dipanvita Srivastava, my colleague, uh, Associate Professor School of Foreign Languages, Associate Professor in French. Padmashri Professor Michel Danino, Professor Sampadananda Mishra, our most eminent speakers, and all our audience who have logged in from different parts of the world to celebrate the 150th birth anniversary of one of India's greatest sons, Sri Aurobindo. Much can be said about his contribution to the freedom struggle and to the heights he scaled in his spiritual quest. He was a man of so many parts that each facet is more dazzling than the other. I am a professor of French literature and culture. And for me, everything in his, everything starting with his name carries the heady scent of the French language. Look how he spelt his name, Aravind for the rest of India, Aurobindo to the Bengalis, but look at the spelling. There is a U between the A and the O, A and the R, and that is very French, my friends. I also take the liberty of quoting the mother here. When asked why French must be studied, she said, English language has brought into India vul vulgar commercialism, and this has to be combated so that the Indian spirit comes back to itself. French is the only language that can combat with English because it has all the qualities of clarity, precision, robust intellectuality, and aristocracy of the spirit. I want these qualities to be superimposed upon whatever is given through English language in India. Finally, Sri Aurobindo chose the French comptoir enclave, Pondicherry, 
of those days and Puducherry of now as the cave of his tapascharya. This was his Gaya where he would attain his Siddhi. It is thanks to him that till today, there is a civilizational partnership between our two countries. But trust me, the French connection runs deeper. Had it perhaps not been for France and for successive French government administrators and governors from 1910 onwards, who prevented the circumvented and circumvented numerous efforts and pressures exerted by the British to deport Sri Aurobindo, he would have been sent into exile into one of those remote British enclaves in Africa or the Far East. One story goes that seditious literature was planted through ruse in the well of the house he lived in. The investigating magistrate, Monsieur Nando, a Frenchman who came with the police, chief of Pondicherry, was so impressed with Sri Aurobindo's vast collection of books and papers in Greek and Latin, all scattered around, that he was, a, he was convinced that a person who read in Greek and Latin could never indulge in illegal acts. So French, isn't it? Nando is said to have exclaimed, he said du latin, he said du grec. He knows Latin, he knows Greek, and left. Prosecutors became friends and admirers. Those who came to scoff remained to pray. The exasperated British tried every trick in the book, the most desperate being to offer to exchange Pondicherry or Puducherry today for places in the West Indies. After one such thwarted attempt to dislodge the master, the Mahakavi Subramanya Bharati burst into this fiery and assertive poem, Jayamundu Bhayamillai Maname. Jayamundu Bhayamillai Maname. In the Janmatile Vidalai Undu Nilayundu. Victory is for sure. Fear not. My heart, victory is for sure. Freedom is ours here and now. It was because of Sri Aurobindo's presence and the profound respect that the French administration and French intelligentsia held for him that the transfer of enclaves to India, the French enclaves to India went smoothly. The governor of French India at the time of independence, François Baron, considered himself a disciple of Sri Aurobindo. The legendary French statesman and war hero Maurice Schumann said, was whom, uh, was whom asked for an audience with Sri Aurobindo, and Sri Aurobindo assured him and his government thereby that Pondicherry would indeed be a permanent meeting place between French, between France and India. Today, Puducherry has remained true to the Sia's vision. Schumann declared, we salute independent India we know perfectly well that the whole of India will one day be independent. We would like that the departure of France as a power and as an authority should coincide with the agreement regarding Pondicherry, which will become a window open to France and to the whole French entity, French culture and French language. Sri Aurobindo's love and proficiency in French, English, German, Greek, Latin and Italian among other foreign languages, only fanned the flames of his passion for Indian languages. Unless the roots of a tree run deep, how will it stand tall and reach for the skies? When he came back from England and took up a job under the Gaikwad of Baroda, he started learning Sanskrit, then Bengali, Marathi, Hindi, Gujarati. He founded the French department in what is today the Maharaja Sayyaji Rao University, and himself taught the language of Moliere till 1906. Later on, he went on to set up today's Jadhavpur University. And is it surprising that even today, the Jadhavpur University, which he had called the National Council of Education, he had been its first principal, still has a pride of place for foreign and Indian languages. He had roped in teachers like Tagore, Gurudas Banerjee, Ananda Kumaraswamy, Surendranath Banerjee, the list is endless. As students of French literature, of European literatures and cultures, we're often misled to espouse the Eurocentric approach. We are bedazzled, lose all critical faculties and forget that our greatest contribution to these cultures and our very own culture would be to see it through the prism of Indian sensibility. We come from a country which the Vande Mataram describes 
at Sumadura Bhashinim. When we write or speak in French, Italian, or any other foreign language, the lyricism of Sanskrit and our mother tongues enrich this language, give new life to its syntax, refresh its soul with new images and metaphors. Let's listen to how Sri Aurobindo describes the French Revolution, which he thought was the vehement death dance of Kali, trampling blindly, furiously on the ruins, along with Yatudhani, the Rakshasi. I quote, she veiled her divine knowledge with the darkness of wrath and passion. She drank blood as wine, naked of tradition and convention. She danced all over Europe and the whole continent was filled with a war cry, the carnage, and rang, rang with ahankara and attahasa. It was only when she found that she was trampling on Mahadeva, God expressed in the principle of nationalism, that she remembered herself, flung aside Napoleon, the mighty Rakshasa, and settled down quietly to do her work of perfecting nationality as the outer shell, within which brotherhood may be securely and largely organized. How exquisitely he explained the French Revolution using familiar Indian symbols and mythology. Is this what we call a croisé or crossover readings today? I don't know. I'd like to believe it. As students of a foreign language, we owe it to our host language and our mother tongues to carry meaning from one culture to another. As translators, we start paying our debts to both languages. Sri Aurobindo was a gifted translator. When he translated the opening passages of the Iliad and the Odyssey, he used Homer's own meter, the dactylic hexameter, whose successful handling has defied the efforts of a number of well-known English poets. His friendship with the extraordinary Tamil poet Sri Subramanya Bharati led him to translate a few poems by the Alvars, Vaishnava saints of the 8th and 9th century, and also a chapter and a half of the Tirukkural by Tiruvalluvar from Tamil into English. His translation of Bankim Chandra's Anand Mot is incomplete, though we have the joy of savoring the Vande Mataram hymn in Sri Aurobindo's English translation. Who but this translator of translators could write, your life on this earth is a divine poem that you are translating into earthly language. His Shedavakam, Savitri, both a legend and a symbol, as he said, eternity in words, as his critics said. Ladies and gentlemen, lend your ears to this poetry that like a mantra sears your soul. I quote from Savitri, as a star uncom uncompanioned moves in heavens, unastonished by the immensities of space, traveling infinitely by its own light, the great are strongest when they stand alone. A God-given might of being is their force. A ray of self-solitude of light guides them. The soul that can live alone with itself meets God. Its lonely universe is their rendezvous. I would like to conclude by reading a fragment from Sri Aurobindo's poem in French. There's a very competent translation available on, in French online, but I crave your indulgence one last time to read you Sri Aurobindo's verse in the original in French. The Alexandrine meter, the noble French verse, is a sheer unalloyed pleasure. I quote, Sur les somme grands sommets blancs, astres éteints et brisés, seul dans l'immense nuit de son cœur désolé, L'ermite, Amita, l'homme élu par les dieux, leur leva son front pur comme un ciel vers les cieux. Et austère, il parla, triste, grave, immuable, l'homme divin, vaincu, au peuple impérissable. Ô vous que vos soleils brillants, purs et lointains, cachent dans les splendeurs immortelles et hautains. Au fils de l'infini, roi de la lumière, guerrier replendissant, resplendissant de la lutte altière, nation à la mort divinement rebelle, vous qui brisez la loi 
de la nuit éternelle, ô vous qui appelez à vos sommets ardus les pontins de la terre, tribus. La vaste nuit parla aux infinis cachés, la monte à ses amants, terribles et voilés. I... May Sri Aurobindo's abiding grace keep the dialogue of cultures alive and thriving in our motherland, and may we see the study of foreign languages flourish on this great soil. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Since Professor Vinkatesan enlightened us with the verses, now I will go for another set, three liners. We have lingered in the chambers of the sea by sea girls wreathed, in, wreathed with seaweed, red and brown, till the human voice wake us and we drown. Of course, you can imagine these are the words of the poet T.S. Eliot, who definitely take us to a transcendental experience that is akin to the ideas of Maharshi Aurobindo. And we have the honor of having with us the author of Time Philosophy of T.S. Eliot, Professor Sumitra Kukriti, who has written widely on literature, philosophy, and English language teaching. And we can proudly say that she is also our Pro Vice Chancellor. On this note, may I request Professor Kukriti for the special address. Thank you, Dr. Tato. Honorable Vice Chancellor Igno, Professor Nageshwar Raoji, my fellow Pro Vice Chancellors, Guest of Honor, Dr. Jayanti S. Ravi, Secretary Oroville Foundation, Distinguished speakers, Padmashree Professor Michael Janino and Professor Sampadanand Mishra, Professor Vidya Venkateshan, Director, Center for European Studies, University of Mumbai, Director, School of Foreign Languages, Professor Malti Mathur, Convener, Dr. Deepan Vikar Srivastava, other members from the school and all other dignitaries attending this event. Good morning to one and all. The introduction that we have just heard by Professor Vidya Venkateshan was really marvelous. Actually, it set the complete tone of the program. And this is really very joyous moment indeed, as SOFL has organized this program in collaboration with the University of Mumbai to mark the 150th birth anniversary of Sri Aurobindo. Aurobindo is one of the rare saints and philosophers who is revered all over the world and especially whose fame transcends beyond the boundaries of nations. Sri Aurobindo has also been called as India's greatest modern philosopher says. And there are thousands of people all over the world who regard him with deep esteem. He's a remarkable personality who on the one hand was a great philosopher while on the other hand, he actively participated in Indian struggle of independence. His integral yoga, the fresh approach towards spirituality makes him to stand at par with saints and philosophers. While his commitment to the nation earned him great reverence by freedom fighters, Sri Aurobindo's in-depth concrete understanding of contemporary political and social issues was really wonderful. But the most fascinating aspect of Sri Aurobindo's character is that unlike other intellectuals and Indian saints who would passively debate over the curse of slavery in the comfort of their drawing rooms or would sit cross-legged and meditate over God, he was completely devoted to the cause of India's freedom struggle. Such was his involvement as when Professor Vidya Venkatesh has already told us that he not only sacrificed his lucrative and prestigious job, but he also served a prison sentence in Alipur, West Bengal for producing revolutionary literature. Then, while contemplating on the secrets of human life, he turned into a great philosopher. Maharshi Aurobindo, as we all know, motivated his followers to strengthen their willpower 
to recognize their true worth and to work collectively to regain their previous glory. He had firm belief that if India would revive its old spiritual heritage and if it would live up to its ideals of universal brotherhood, it would require its status of Vishwa Guru, universal teacher. Uh, this is really surprising and it's difficult to imagine for an ordinary person that despite studying in England, Sri Aurobindo was completely devoted to Indian culture, Indian values and Sanatan Hindu dharma. He believed in the theory that Hindu religion is really the eternal religion because it embraces all others. He recognized immense potential of the nation and its citizens and he wanted Indians to perceive their inner strength. He believed that whenever any nation was uprooted from its culture, it lost its purpose of being. So if, in, if India wants to remain India, it must remember its cultural legacy. I would like to conclude with the words that Aramitu, Aravindu's philosophy brings spiritual rejuvenation and motivates people to work towards the cause of humanity, transcending the boundaries of race, caste, class, and nations, establishes universal brotherhood among all. His dreams are still being shaped and nurtured in Auroville, a place without any false boundaries. I'm sure that the erudite speakers and the scholars would definitely enlighten all on these issues of Aravindo's philosophy and would unravel the mysteries of integral yoga for us. I congratulate SOFL for organizing this program in collaboration with University of Mumbai. And I look forward for more such collaborative events. My best wishes. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Um, the mother helped shaping Maharshi Aurobindo's vision into reality and Auroville was created. In 1968, in the month of February, on the 28th day, mother pinned down four pointers as the charter of Auroville. The first one read, Auroville n'appartient à personne en particulier. Auroville appartient à toute l'humanité dans son ensemble. Mais, pour séjourner à Auroville, il faut être le serviteur volontaire de la conscience divine. Auroville belongs to nobody in particular. Auroville belongs to humanity as a whole. But to live in Auroville, one must willingly be a servitor of the divine consciousness. And presently, Auroville has an outstanding person as its secretary, Dr. Jayanti S. Ravi, a multifaceted personality. Dr. Ravi is a scientist, a civil servant, a writer, great orator, educator, performing vocalist, and a thinker with a master's degree in nuclear physics from the University of Madras and an MPA from Harvard University and a PhD in e-governance. She has authored books, published, international, published in international journals, guided doctoral students, and also been a visiting faculty at Harvard University. In her long career of civil service, she also served as director of National Advisory Council with the Prime Minister's office. She is the secretary of Auroville Foundation. And if you allow me, ma'am, I would also add something that she is not only a polyglot. Her voice has mesmerized hundreds with Karnataka Shastriya Sangeet and also Gujarati and Tamil songs to mention a few. She is the guest of honor of this webinar. Now, may I request you, ma'am, to deliver the keynote address? Namaste, greetings to everybody. And thank you, Dr. 
Deepattacharya Tatoji. I am extremely happy to be here on this very special occasion. I want to specially acknowledge the presence of the Honorable Vice Chancellor of IGNU, Professor Nageshwar Rao. Namaste to you. Uh, Professor Sumitra Kukreti, the Pro Vice Chancellor. It was a delight to hear Professor Vidya Venkateshan, Director of the Center of European Studies, University of Mumbai. And of course, Dr. Dipanvita Srivastava, who also reached out to me, invited me, Professor Malti Mathur. I'm very happy that in the lecture sessions, we have Professor Michelle Danino and Professor Sampadanand Mishra, both of whom are very actively connected with Oroville. And also they are a part of the high level committee, specially constituted for the 150th birth anniversary of Sri Aurobindo, which is chaired by our honorable prime minister. I also want to take this occasion to convey my greetings to Dr. Uma Kanjilal, whom I met this morning because at the beginning of my career, I used to be in Delhi many, many years ago in the late eighties. I used to work at a place which was then called Nuclear Science Center. The name has then post Pokhran metamorphosed into Inter-University Accelerator Center. So again, want to convey my greetings to all of you uh, on the panel and everybody uh, who is participating in this beautiful um, event today, the, the national uh, conference that is being organized from all over India and the world, the national webinar. And I wish your indulgence in starting with something very close to my heart, the Sri Aurobindo Gayatri. And Om Tat Varam Rupam Jyoti Parasya Yanna Satye Nadi Paye Satye Nadi Paye Om Tat Savitur Varam Rupam Jyoti Parasya it means let us meditate on the most auspicious or the best form of savitri on the light of the supreme which shall illumine us with the truth, which is referred to as the Sri Aurobindo Gayatri, and which is something that I like to begin every uh, presentation interaction with. This was a practice for several years, even before I formally got appointed to the post of the Secretary Auroville Foundation. And I think it a great privilege today to be with all of you. Since we are celebrating the 150th birth anniversary of Sri Aurobindo, which coincides exactly with the 75th birth anniversary of free India or the independence of India. I thought as has been the general theme of this entire 150th birth anniversary of Sri Aurobindo, which is being celebrated across India, across the world, the overarching theme for it has been the five dreams of Sri Aurobindo. So I thought today I would delve on that in some detail and try to share some thoughts which I think are extremely relevant, if not most relevant today, even more relevant perhaps than they were back then, and how every word of it was not only contemporary but futuristic. And we find that this is not only a vision, it is also a kind of mission for all of us, all of us who love India, who love the world, who love humanity, 
and are also seekers for that paradise on earth, which Sri Aurobindo refers to as the sunlit path in Savitri. Yes, he says, I quote him, yes, there are happy ways near to God's sun, but few are they who tread the sunlit path. Only the pure in soul can walk in light. An exit is shown, a road of hard escape from the sorrow and the darkness and the chain. But how shall a few escaped release the world? This is Sri Aurobindo in Savitri. And I think this very beautifully falls in place against the backdrop of window himself but we are given to understand after a lot of soul searching and reaching out to the archives and others that his voice in the physical form is perhaps not available but this was presented on all india radio tiruchirappalli by one of the announcers or broadcasters there and it, it is something that i would certainly urge all of us all of us who love india who love the world and sri aurobindo's perspective of how we can really have an enduring and an enduring uh, unity of the world, how that can be not just, as Kukreti ji mentioned, not just a passive set of ideas, philosophizing plainly, but something which is coupled by what we in the circles of Sri Aurobindo like to use the word direct action. He believed not just in theory, but he believed in praxis. He believed in transposing all those thoughts, inspirations, not just at the mental level, but something which was deeply inspired, transpose it on the ground and make it happen. And in that context, with an intention, perhaps, of his father, of having him to, to be left in England with no connection with India. They didn't want any influence of India to actually come on him. This is what we're given to understand. But Mother India, her culture, all of this was so strong that it just had to. It was almost like an evolutionary thrust that he talks of. It had to be an existential thrust that just it's like the teething of a baby which cannot be stopped, the birthing of something which cannot be stopped. It just had to take birth in him. And that's how his huge stay, the long duration, as we heard about all that happened subsequently on his return to India. But before that, it made himself absolutely well equipped. And from childhood, the signs of his greatness, his absolute, the, the, the superman in him, uh, so many aspects of his work, expressed were manifesting in his poetry, the kind of mastery as Dr. Vidya so beautifully explained to us, whether it was French, whether it was Greek, Latin, Spanish, so many things, the poet poems that he wrote, all of that. And finally, the culmination of all this was the, the five dreams, I could say, which is a very pithy, a very um, compact and yet a very concise statement of where we could do. So for those of us who probably have not had the privilege of reading it so far, in uh, a very, very short abbreviation, the executive summary, which we are all used to in today's date and time, the first dream was a revolutionary movement to create a free and united India. So I will go into detail in this. And he also had very bold words, which in today's context may seem a little insensitive sometimes, maybe politically incorrect. But I would like to read that part of his statement too, to say how he had great faith in the fact that India cannot really be divided, that we will have to come together, but not 
by any kind of co coercion or force, but he said that is something that is a very divine and a very natural, a very beautiful thing for the coming together of humanity because he really thought of the entire humanity being shrink wrapped or brought together as one, the whole of humanity as one with that sense of human unity. So the first dream was about a free and united India. And if you look at it progressively, the second was about the resurgence and liberation of the peoples of Asia and her return to her great role in the progress of human civilization. After India and Asia, the third dream was about a world union, which would form the outer basis of a fairer, brighter and nobler world and life for all mankind. But it was also to be coupled with not just the outer, the gloss, the outer manifestation, but the glow within what he refers to in the sunlit path, that all this strife, competition, aggression, anger, hatred, it had to be metamorphosed into something with a raised consciousness and extreme raised sensitivity to really make ourselves a willing servitors of divine consciousness, as the mother says, and not really think of our egoistic demands that I want this and I want that. But the fourth and fifth are very beautiful next progressive logical steps of it. He talks of the spiritual gift of India to the world and which is something that we see in great uh, ways, shapes in so many different ways even today. And it was present back then already it had begun. But today we find that there's a great deal of appetite for yoga, yoga not just as Hatha yoga, but integral yoga, yoga that really talks of being uh, in union in everything and anything that we do, just as the Bhagavad Gita talks of uh, Samatvam Yoga Uchate and how basically it is about uh, being conscious in everything that we do. And the fifth uh, was about the, the evolutionary step to a higher and larger consciousness and how Sri Aurobindo was somebody who very strongly believed and professed and wrote extensively that this whole evolution was also work in progress. There was a time when the might of the lion, it was probably believed that physical strength was the strongest, but subsequently as beings with a mind that could discern, that could analyze, understand, reason, it was felt that human beings were at the more evolved level in, in the sense of evolution. But he believed that that was not the final full stop and that while we do have an intellect, we have a mind that can analyze, that can reason, it also tends to divide between me and the other. And that's where the ego, which comes in, but he felt and he has written extensively about the next stage where you have the Superman, you have the evolution of into another being, which would be able to really synthesize everybody and work from that state of intuition with divine consciousness, which the spark of which, as Swami Vivekananda has also said, it is there in each one of us, but as it manifests, it makes us realize that it's not really about me and the other. And where we really see this inherent and this very uh, obvious unity uh, across all beings, across everything. Now, as we look at the speech that Sri Aurobindo gave, it, I would like to read certain portions of it and also explain my own humble understanding of what I think. He says that he talks about how 15th of August has a significance not only, not only is, it's, is it the birthday of free India, according to Sri Aurobindo, it signifies the entry into the committee of nations of a new power with untold potentialities, and which is great part in determining the political, social, cultural, and spiritual future of humanity. So he was again somebody who was educated in the West, grew up there completely, and people also like to think of him as somebody who then spent considerable amount of time from a contemporary education back then. He went back, plumbed into India's past, uncovered the secret of the Vedas, in a way translated it back because a lot of it was still then by scholars uh, probably set aside as something which was a little barbaric and so on. They felt that Vedas, uh, they spoke of native certain barbaric 
um, symbols, etc. But he's the one who decoded it. And actually in Secret of the Vedas, he also talks of these algebraic uh, terms which are used to connote, connote something else and to uh, refer to something else. And so he was probably somebody who didn't shy away from using the word spiritual, divine, consciousness, all these words, which even today in a lot of intellectual settings, when we have converse conversations, these are things that do still make people a little uncomfortable. But he spoke boldly of the role that India has to play in terms of all this, the future of humanity with political, social, cultural, and the spiritual future of humanity. He also, his humility, Personally, he says, I read, I quote, to me personally, it must naturally be gratifying that this date, which was notable only for me because it was my own birthday, celebrated annually by those who have accepted my gospel of life, should have acquired this vast significance. But he also says as a mystic, I take this identification not as a coincidence or fortuitous accident, but as a sanction and seal of the divine power which guides my steps on the work with which I began life. And he says that those dreams that I had thought of earlier, which almost seemed like an impossibility, I can observe, he says, on this day, either approaching fruition or initiated on an, on, and on their way to their achievement. Now, he also goes on to say that the a rising of India or the rising of India was not just for herself, but there's something far more important that she had to do, even an indication of the role of India as a Vishwa Guru. He says, I quote, for I have, I have always held and said that India was a rising, not to serve her own material interests only, to achieve expansion, greatness, power and prosperity, though these two she must not neglect, and certainly not like others to acquire domination of other people, but to live also for God and the world as a helper and leader of the whole human race. So with that, he goes on to explain the five dreams. And then he says India is free, but she has not achieved unity. And here he also says that the partition, I will read out this portion. It is, as I said, it might seem a little uh, bold and maybe sometimes may make people wonder, is this relevant? But I think we must respect what he had written. And I read it out in quote. It is to be hoped that the Congress and the nation will not accept the settled fact of he's referring to the communal division into Hindu and Muslim seems to have hardened into the figure of a permanent political division of the country. It is to be hoped that the Congress and the nation will not accept the settled fact as forever settled or as anything more than a temporary expedient. For it lasts, India may be seriously weakened, even crippled. And then he adds, the partition of the country must go. And finally, I quote, but by whatever means, the division must and will go. For without it, the destiny of India might be seriously impaired and even frustrated. But that must not be. So this is the first dream that he refers to. And I think it is so important, even if we left this part of it, the fact that we're really aspiring and we have come a long way. Today, India has achieved a great deal of progress. Today, if we look at various parameters. India is increasingly, we find that on so many parameters, India has progressed. And the kind of contribution as India has made, I had the privilege of working for four years as the principal secretary of health in Gujarat before I came here. And I must say that even for the pandemic, given that it was something that was completely, there was so much of uncertainty in terms of treatment protocols, in terms of what is to be how is, what are the prevention, preventive measures, vaccination, all that was unclear when we began. And the complete dependence on a host of equipment, consumables, medicines for to be imported from abroad or dependence on external uh, countries and agencies. But gradually, even with that, within that period of one to two years, India became more and more uh, self-sufficient, atmanirbhar, and the kind of role that India played 
in vaccination, not only for covering a, a huge number of her citizens uh, completely free of cost, but also offering this to so many countries of the world. So this is the kind of leadership that India, and oftentimes we notice that when there is a crisis, when there is a conflict or there is a problem, such as the pandemic that we all confronted, it also helps us focus and bring out the best. So when we, his first dream of a free and united India, not just in the context of earlier what he refers to as the partition having to go, but also the whole of India actually becoming free in a, in a complete sense, freedom, not just from external externalities, but also internal freedom for every individual, where we are freed from things that those lower forces that pull us down, whether it is anger, hatred, jealousy, greed, all of it, but really uh, elevating ourselves and rising above that is something and harmony, free and united India, which again, harmony, not again by wanting to stick to what is convenient to me and mine, but to actually make ourselves willing servitors of the divine and actually being open for the larger good, Sarve Jana, and for, for the larger good of everybody, uh, for the good and welfare of everyone. The second dream that he speaks of is about a resurgent Asia. And he says Asia has arisen and large parts of it have been liberated back then. But he says the uni when he talks of the unification of mankind with Asia, the whole of Asia in that context, here too, I quote him, India has begun to play a prominent part. And if she can develop the larger statesmanship, which is not limited by the present facts and immediate possibilities, but looks into the future and brings it nearer, her presence may make all the difference between a slow and timid and a bold and swift development. And so he does talk of unification of the people. It is necessary in the course of nature, an inevitable movement and its achievement can be safely foretold. And then he, has, he says, its necessity for the nations also is clear, for without it, the freedom of the small peoples can never be safe hereafter, and even large and powerful nations cannot really be secure. And then a new spirit of oneness will have to take hold of the human race. And this in the context of also a world, he talks of a complete world, which is a greater, nobler, brighter world, and says that nationalism will then have fulfilled itself an international spirit and outlook must grow up and international forms and institutions, even it may be such developments as dual or multilateral citizenship and a voluntary fusion of cultures may appear in the process of the change and the spirit of nationalism losing its militancy may find these things perfectly compatible with the integrity of its own outlook. And so a new spirit of oneness when he talks of a brighter, nobler, greater world, a fairer world, he is referring to this third gift, uh, the th third dream that he's referring to about a complete world union based on all these qualities on the outer and the inner. The fourth gift, of course, is about the spiritual gift of India to the world. And at that time, he says, India's spirituality is entering Europe and America in ever increasing measure. That movement will grow amid the disasters of the time, more and more eyes are turning towards her with hope. And there is even an increasing resort, not only to her teachings, but to her psychic and spiritual practice. And what more could be relevant, apt, appropriate in today's context too, where we see a lot of strife, we see stress, tension, all kinds of problems still plaguing we across, I mean, the whole world. And when we look at the three words that drove or th those led to the French revolution, liberté, égalité, and fraternité. We find that if we just go by the gospel of liberté or freedom, we've seen that pure market capital forces alone don't work as we've seen in movements like the Occupy Wall Street movement. That alone is not going to be sufficient. We've also seen how equality, égalité alone may not work because we've seen how there has been a crumbling of the erstwhile Soviet uh, bloc and how communism as a concept alone may not be sustainable. But however, fraternity, and if there is that 
this is the capstone, as Sri Aurobindo also mentioned, if this is something amongst these three, if that is something that binds all of us, not just in a very clinical, in a very cut and dry way of saying everybody is equal, but we may have our uniqueness, we have our cultures, we have our beliefs, we have beauty, aesthetics, which defines each country, each nation, each soul. And yet, uh, if there is that freedom for us to practice, profess what we believe, and yet be connected with that deeper understanding, that elevated, uh, raised consciousness of the fact that in all this diversity, we are indeed one. I think that is what we are striving collectively within India. And this, these last three gifts are where Oro will, which was referred to also by Tatoji earlier, and all of you have heard about it. It comes it is something which is the crucible, the laboratory for all these dreams to be actually practiced there, experimented for all the people living here to offer themselves as uh, in, a, in a lighter vein as guinea pigs for this beautiful experiment, which is inspired by the vision of Sri Aurobindo, which was implemented by the mother. And I'd seek your indulgence for a minute in reading out um, what mother on the the spiritual collaborator of Sri Aurobindo, who was originally known. She was born in Paris. There's a French connection. She also engaged a French architect and town planner, one of the most renowned persons of his time back then. She specially commissioned him, engaged him to develop the full blueprint of the city of Auroville. And this was such a bold and beautiful idea dream that she had thought of way back then. And this is she says on the 28th of February, 1968, when the foundation stone of Auroville was being laid, greetings from Auroville to all men of goodwill are invited to Auroville, all those who thirst for progress and aspire to a higher and truer life. We did hear her charter in French, but I take the liberty of reading out maybe just the first and last points of her charter. She says, Auroville belongs to nobody in particular. Auroville, and Auroville means in French, it requires no explanation, city named after Sri Aurobindo. It's also referred to as the city of dawn. Auroville belongs to humanity as a whole, but to live in Auroville, one must be a willing servitor of divine consciousness. Auroville will be the place of an unending education of constant progress and a youth that never ages. So we have a large number of people here who are on the other side of 90, but full of life, full of um, spiritual, uh, uh, you know, raised consciousness. But they're also people who have excellent health, a lot of uh, on all the, the five dimensions, the panchakosha, as we say, on the physical, um, uh, vital, the emotional, aesthetic, psychic, all these dimensions, people who are doing very well. And finally, Auroville, Auroville will be a site of material and spiritual researches for a living embodiment of an actual human unity with a capital U. And then the mother had made a sketch of the new symbol of Auroville on 16th of August, 1971, and seen and approved the drawing below. I have it here in a book. But I want to explain, she gave the following explanation of its meaning. The dot at the center, there's a central dot, a circle, small circle, a circle behind with five sectors around it. So she says the dot at the center represents unity with a capital U. For a long time, I didn't quite understand when we keep talking of human unity. Is it the unity between two people, between several sets of people who are now living in Auroville and who will eventually, she has envisaged a city, a township with 50,000 people of which we have currently about 3,400 people. So this is also an invitation to men and women of goodwill across India, across the world who would love to come. We want all of you to come to Auroville, come here as visitors, as interns, volunteers, as people who want to participate in this beautiful experiment. And also possibly, if everything goes well, you can join this beautiful experiment. So she says this word unity is with a capital U. It's not just the unity between two human beings or many human beings, which knowing human nature is often fragile. It is conditional. 
I may like you, I may feel united with you as long as you respond to what I say, or as long as there is something that you say which is not offensive to me, may be our constructive un unity with a small you, which is normally referred to. But if that unity is anchored in something far deeper within us, the divine, and in the other, which is also the divine, then we really elevate ourselves and go beyond these likes, dislikes, preferences, and we truly become willing servitors of divine consciousness. And in this, she says, I quote, the dot at the center represents unity with a capital U, comma, the supreme. And then there's a semicolon. The inner circle represents the creation, the conception of the city. The petals represent the power of expression realization. So on this note, Finally, we come to the fifth dream, which I strongly believe was the basis was the, for, for Auroville to take shape. And here he says, the rest is still a personal hope and an idea which began to take hold both in India and in the West on forward-looking minds. The difficulties in the way are more forbid formidable, but difficulties were made to be overcome. And if the supreme will is there, they will be overcome. If this evolution is to take place, Evolution, we spoke about work in progress and the evolution to the next state of the supermind and the supramental faculties. Here too, if this evolution is to take place, since it must come through a growth of the spirit and inner consciousness, the initiative can come from India. And although the scope must be universal, the central movement may be hers. Such is the content which I put into this date of India's liberation, whether or how far or how soon this connection will be fulfilled depends upon this new and free India is what he said. And I would just complete now with two final points. In Sri Aurobindo's work called The Human Cycle, he describes the conditions for the coming of a spiritual age and says, therefore, if the spiritual change, he speaks of something called a Gnostic society, which is what Auroville has been created. It's a place that synthesizes material and spiritual, matter and spirit. So we see beautiful things of abundance, beauty, extreme functionality, uh, incredible beauty, aesthetics, all of it happening here. If you look at the kind of miracle that has happened in Matra Mandir, I don't know how many of you have visited Auroville. Matra Mandir is at the center of it. And it's again a place which is surrounded by beautiful gardens. A complete water channel has just been completed. We have a beautiful lake taking shape there. The entire city, which has been designed by the mother, but it was done through the hands of this architect called Roger Angers, who was also from Paris. There is a French connection. And we have an exhibition of this happening at the Museum of Metropolitan Art, MoMA at New York. And in Auroville too, we have this exhibition, the city exhibition happening. We'd like to welcome you all. And there, there's a great deal of sensitivity much before Tesla even took shape or hybrid cars were there. Mother in her handwriting wrote about an element of Auroville called the crown, which is a circular pathway, which uh, is around Matra Mandir, which is believed to be the soul of Auroville. And this crown is believed to be the spinal cord of Auroville. And she said vehicles that would go here would be e-vehicles and not with a speed greater than 15 kilometers per hour, 16 kilometers per hour. So that is the kind of sensitivity she had for this beautiful city with a lot of waterworks, with complete uh, marriage of the greens and the functional utilities, but to house this critical number of people eventually so that the experiment of human unity could actually be done in the manner that she wanted. And I often think of this as a little jigsaw puzzle. As children, we're all given these little games to play with. And we spent a lot of time trying to fix it. It's not that we're creating something new, but the process of bringing it together itself is a great uh, exercise for all of us. And similarly, she gave this design of the city. We have a signed document, which she used to submit to the Ford Foundation back, back then. And uh, it's amazing to see how she um, not only gave details of the roads, the kind of lifestyle, but she's also explained what is the amount of population in each of these buildings, what kind of demographics, what age group, how many people would be there. So that's the kind of people from all the 200 countries of the world that we have today. All that have to be incorporated here. And in that, 
even the size of buildings, when we see there are multi-story buildings, but which are not vertical apartments or skyscrapers, which some of them look a little monstrous elsewhere in the world. But she actually gave things that look like hillscapes, buildings. There's a line of goodwill, line of force, lines of force, where it's like a little hillscape that goes and takes a certain uh, curvature. So it's something which is of an ar architectural uh, marvel as well, which is taking shape here. And we want to use this beautiful forum also to invite you all, welcome you all. And finally, the last thing I want to complete with is this little um, request of uh, what he referred to as a Gnostic society and his human cycle, his work, he refers to it. Therefore, the spiritual change of which we have been speaking is to be effected. It must unite two conditions which have to be simultaneously satisfied, but are most difficult to bring together. There must be the individual and individuals who are able to see, to develop, to recreate themselves in the image of the spirit and to communicate both their ideas and its power to the mass. And there must be at the same time a mass, a society, a communal mind, or at least the constituents of a group body, the possibility of a group soul, which is capable of receiving and effectively assimilating, ready to follow and effectively arrive, not compelled by its own inherent deficiencies, its defects of preparation, to stop on the way or fall back before the decisive change is made. So on that note, since Vidya ji reminded us of Supramanya Bharati, who is again a great poet, a patriotic poet of uh, South India, India and the world. There, there are a few lines of his which are very inspiring. He said, Oli kanninai va va va, urudhi konda nenjinai va va va. It's a long poem, but the gist of it and Sri Aurobindo and Subramanya Bharati were great friends. They spent many evenings together. And as she mentioned, he also translated the uh, famous work of Andal, uh, who was a great saint of uh, a great devotee of Sri Krishna because Sri Aurobindo too had a very, very special experience of Krishna Kali when he was in the Alipur jail. And they used to discuss this. The meaning of this poem is with eyes lit so bright, a heart strong and gleeful words with strong shoulders and a clear mind. Rise against smallness of thought, but feel for those who are humble, walk like a might ox, my dear, I beckon you here. I beseech you, young India, to show your unmatched skill. Rise and shine like the morning sun on a land that's lost its luster. I beckon you to esteem the culture that seems lost. With just a gaze of your eyes, go beyond both fame and infamy. This is translated by somebody called Narayan Srinivas that I got as I was doing my research on in 2014. On this note, again, I want to thank the organizers for this beautiful national webinar and do hope. Again, we want to welcome, I like to have this hashtag come to Auroville as the uh, you know, key message for all of you. We need a lot of people to be here, get in that fresh energy, uh, which has faith in something as bold, beautiful, audacious as Sri Aurobindo had dreamt of and something that mother had the courage the practicality to implement as a spiritual collaborator. There's work in progress. So we are in the midst of building something beautiful. We, we are very inspired also by our Honorable Prime Minister who has who's chairing this beautiful uh, celebrations, the 150th celebrations as a part of the high level committee and giving us all the support to take all these ideas of Sri Aurobindo from the plane of ideation to direct action and implementation. So once again, uh, thank you so much for inviting me. Namaste. Thank you, ma'am, for the elaboration of the profound teachings of Maharshi Aurobindo and in so simply and uh, so enlightened and in enlightening experience it is. In fact, Maharshi Aurobindo was a teacher in a literal sense and in its extended sense. As Professor Venkatesan was saying that he was the founding principal of Bengal National College, which later on became Jadavpur University, which started, on, started functioning on the 15th of August, 1906. 
Aurobindo, Rishi Aurobindo writes, when we established this college and left other occupations, other chances of life to devote our lives to this institution, we did so because we hoped to see it in the foundation, the nucleus of a nation, of the new India, which is to begin its career after this night of sorrow and trouble, on that day of glory and greatness when India will work for the world. And in another, on another instance, while he was talking about system of national education, published in 1907, he said that everyone has in him something divine, something his own, a chance of perfection and strength in however small a sphere which God offers him to take or refuse. The task is to find it, develop it, and use it. Since then, the time has changed, and today's new India has envisaged a new education policy, and our institution, IGNU, is playing a nodal position. As you know, it is indeed the People's University. The true essence of education is to offer everybody a chance to develop that faculty and knowledge that Maharshi Aurobindo was referring to. And we are doing it under the leadership of our respected vice chancellor and internationally acclaimed educationist, Professor Nagesha Rao. Now, may I call on you, sir, humbly to, del I mean, to deliver the presidential address and my sincere apologies for the delay that we have incurred during the process, sir. Good noon to all of you. After listening to Jayanti Ji, it's very difficult to speak on Arvindo. The way she articulated the entire philosophy and the linkage with Indian traditions, that is really marvelous. The initiation itself is very, very soothing and inspiring to all of us. I really thank her for sparing the precious time for all of us. School of Foreign Languages in collaboration with the University of Mumbai Center for European Studies is remembering Sri Arvindo. The great idea, which I thought that maybe the discipline of philosophy will come forward. But strange to see that the discipline of French has come up. And for that, I must compliment Deepanvita ji also. And she was very keen to have it from the beginning. And uh, today when I listen to Vidya Venkateshan ji, it is really useful to all of us, especially even in the discipline of French also. Because initially I was thinking that why a theme of philosophy or a great thinker, great poet, great nat nationalist is being brought to the field of this discipline. But later on when I listened to Venkateshan Ji, then that linkage is also being explained. The most important day for all of us is the 15th August. And that day coincides with the birth day of Sri Arvindo Ji. And that is what Jayanti Ji has said in the beginning itself. That is the greatest motivator to all of us when we are talking about Azadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav. 75 years we have completed. And the vision which Arvindoji is having, now we find that 
most of his thinkings, most of his spiritual addresses, they are relevant to us and now we can practice those things to make us Vishwaguru for which we all are striving for the last few years. We had large treasure of knowledge. We are very, very rich in terms of spiritual wisdom. And that carries the weight. That carries the spirit also. And that spirit is going to help us to move ahead. One area which Jayanti ji has said linking the age of an individual and the spiritual changes which take place, evolution of spirituality with respect to the individual's life cycle. That is very, very important. And everyone now can introspect themselves to see that how those changes they take place automatically. And that philosophy, we are not knowing it, but still we find that it is going on in our minds. During the childhood, the spirituality is different. The spiritual messages are different. When they go for work, there the spirituality also helps them to do their things properly. And this spirituality motivates all of us for our actions. And that is what we are getting from these two distinguished speakers. True nationalist. The five basic principles which she outlined for all of us. They are the basics of life. If you have to get success in your life, if you want to move ahead in your life, keep those things in mind. You're also having two more distinguished speakers. Professor Michael Danino, who is going to talk about India's rebirth. and linking it to Arvindo Ji. Arvindo has seen the dawn of our independence, but he could not stay with us to guide us and to inspire us and give us a path of action. But now we can visualize it. And that is what maybe the Professor Denino would like to share with all of us. Languages in education and national building, the theme on which the national education policy is now talking about. We have to reach to individuals, learners, in their own language. Because all other languages which a learner learns only after five to six years. But the mother tongue, the learning process of mother tongue, it is much more than any other language. So therefore, we have to look at our own education system where we can try to see that how we can promote the use of mother tongue in our teaching learning process. I'm happy to share with all of you that Indira Gandhi National Open University has recently started an initiative in this context. We are having Swayam Prabha channels. The four Swayam Prabha channels, we are using it for the purpose. And from 6th of January, what we experimented is that the disciplines, especially in the field of social sciences, the sociology, the history, public administration,
political science, they all first year courses, they are now being taught in mother tongue. The first chapter of sociology for which the lectures they are being delivered in Telugu, Malayalam, Marathi, Gujarati, Punjabi, Odia, the 12 languages. And this process is on. By now, we have crossed 2000 sessions, covering each of these disciplines around 30, 130 or 140 lectures. And that can again be reused, putting the same in YouTube. And we tried to invite the people from the same area to teach those subjects so that the person who is proficient in the mother tongue is now teaching to the learners who wants to get their studies completed in their mother tongue. The purpose is that our teaching learning process gets much more effectiveness and results. And that is what the national education policy is continuously emphasizing. And maybe when we try to listen to Mishaji, that sort of forward movement process may be helping us to see that how we can move ahead in that direction also. I'm really inspired by the presence of Vidyaji as well as Jayanti ji and their philosophical discourse, the presentation to all of us. And my, I hope that my own faculty, my own teachers, they are carefully looking into it. They are carefully listening to it and try to see, try to imbibe what they can do for our learners. Because ultimately, if you are putting these things in our self-learning material, we are having the widest reach. Access is very, very high. 35 lakh learners are with us. So any message which you put on the website, the possibility of that message reaching to 35 lakhs is within our domain. Plus, we are also having 38 lakh alumni passed out students through which also we are in direct connect. So it's a big family wants to understand the Indian philosophy of nurturing education. And maybe we can imbibe those things in our curricula and teaching learning process. The results we will definitely get very, very effective. Maybe as a nationalist, we all can contribute more significantly for the national aspirations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, we have noted down all the guidelines that you have provided to us. And um, we are also very, uh, uh, you know, encouraged by you to put these things as you have guided us into the curriculum, into the self-learning mo modules and reach out to the maximum number of people. Thank you, sir. Now, as the vote of thanks for the, this particular session, I will just quickly run through that. It was a very, very mindful session, as I would say, that uh, right from when Dr. Uh, Srivastava said that, um, that Rishi Aurobindo or Maharshi Aurobindo was also a yogi. That is a very, very important point, ma'am. We have noted it down. And he was the, pro I mean, you said, prophet of Indian nationalism because nationalism is a subject that you know preoccupies India even today under many circumstances. And uh, you said that uh, French was a spontaneous memory of uh, Maharshi Aurobindo, which is very encouraging to us. And the shift of the narrative is happening now. And uh, now I'll come to the 
extraordinary presentation of Dr. Venkatesan, where um, she, uh, she led us to understand that there is a heavy scent of French in Auroville, Aurobindo, uh, Rishi Aurobindo's philosophy and uh, everything. And she actually talked about uh, the French uh, uh, investigators saying, il se latin, il se grec, he knows Latin, he knows Greek. Um, it's like really, I mean, we all traveled back to that moment. It was so beautifully said. And we have also uh, kind of, uh, after that, had our Pro Vice Chancellor, Professor Kukreti. Madam, you talked about uh, becoming Vishwa Guru. We all are trying in our very little cap capacity and capability, whatever we have in every ground. And you have also talked about Sanatan Dharma and uh, philosophy of yoga. We are also trying to, uh, I, I must just tell you in one instance that um, even if you go for a word, uh, scram, you know, word jumbled words app today from US, their yoga is an English word. And it is coming from US for US citizens. It is very, very inspiring. And with the present leadership of the country, we have reached out and we have actually trying our best to give out the best from our culture to the, to the world. And Dr. Ravi, I mean, you had talked about, I mean, like you started with a mesmerizing uh, Aurobindo Gayatri Mantra. <laughs> I think we all had an experience of what I was trying to refer to, like, you know, because I had personally listened to your kinetic renditions and very long ones because and you gave us that chance here i'm like really grateful personally to you for giving us this chance and of course the mission of india the sunlit parts that you have talked of you have talked of the mindfulness and how the minds can be cultivated and the dreams of uh, rishi or uh, maharshi arabindo that is like uh, i think you have charted out a new course for the younger generation who are here today thank you ma'am a lot and lastly we had our respected vice chancellor um and uh, we are like really grateful to him that he recognized the french connection uh, in this indian subject that we brought together this morning and um, sir we are definitely trying our best to fulfill the dream of being a Vishya Guru and New India that even Oro, Rishi Aurobindo talked about back in 2000, uh, one, uh, 1907. And we are really encouraged by you, uh, all your words, and we are going to definitely see how we can put forward the crux of the entire, entire discourse that is happening today into the curriculum and to reach out to the uh, wider uh, audience. With this, I would say that we are concluding the inaugural session. We were supposed to take five minutes break, um, but we can reduce it into two minutes because as we are running slightly late, um, uh, so I would request uh, um, you all to come back within two minutes, if you please. Thank you.
ओके हेलो वी आर बैक गुड आफ्टरनून टू एवरीवन वेलकम बैक टू द मेन सेशन ऑफ द सेमिनार शाल वी बिगिन yes uh, tatu we should or we are running slightly late so yeah. i guess it's a good idea to start the yeah. sessions yeah uh sincere apology from our side to all the participants because uh we are actually running late sri aurobindo was arrested on 2nd of may 1908 under the charge of conspiracy he was also kept in solitary confinement for certain periods the year of 1908 friday 1st of may nor did i know at the time that this day would mark the end of a chapter in my life and there stretched before me a year's imprisonment though i have described it as the imprisonment for a year it was in effect like a year's seclusion in an ashram or hermitage finally the compassionate sarva mangalamaya sri hari all good lord brought me to your to a yogashram and himself stayed as a guru and companion in that tiny sadhan kutir seat of spiritual discipline this yogashram happened to be the british prison the british government's wrath had but one significant outcome i found god wrote maharshi aurobindo in his autobiographical note and with this we are now going to listen to an exception scholar michel danino on sri aurobindo's sri aurobindo and india's rebirth before i welcome you sir i will just give you a brief introduction of you to all french born michel danino has lived in india since 1977 a student of indian civilization he has written on proto historical india for example the lost river on the trail of the saraswati and indian culture indian culture and india's future sri aurobindo and india's rebirth Since 2011, he has been teaching courses on Indian civilization, knowledge systems at IIT Gandhi Nagar, where he has been assisting Archaeological Sciences Center. He is also a convener of CBSC committee for the course of knowledge traditions and practices of India, whose two-volume textbook he co-edited with Professor Kapil Kapoor. he is a former member of indian council for historical research a member of central advisory board on culture and of national steering committee for the implementation of national education policy in 2017 he he was awarded padma shri for his work exceptional contribution on education and culture for which we all fellow indians are very proud of you sir sir now may i request you i mean and my due apologies to you for this delay thank you so much dr tato and many thanks to uh, dr dipang wita in particular for the very kind invitation and uh, everyone else at ignu um my old friend dr vidya venkateshan at university of mumbai and and all those behind this event um as we know time is a little short so i'm going to jump into my topic it is perhaps nothing very new for most of you it is basically a, a broad sweeping overview of sir mindo's concept of india as it evolved right from his students day in 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 cambridge in in uk uh in britain as it was called in those days and um up to almost the end of his life uh, on this earth so i would like to actually share a few slides simply because i will take the if i have uh i think uh, you will have to somebody will have to make me co-host 
for the purpose. I cannot do screen sharing. So if you can kindly, Dr. Dipan Wipas, or someone uh, give me the, the right sharing rights, I will, because there are certain very nice photographs, which many of you will be familiar with, but it's, it's good to see them again in the context of uh, a few quotations, which I, I will use to illustrate his vision. So if I, yeah, can, I now you have, I have, I have, I have the, I have. Thanks so much, Ashtosh. Just a second, I will come to my slides. Tato, is it done? It is done, it is done. It is done and the question will be, or oh, not this one. The question will be whether, I'm sorry, whether you can see these slides. Yes, we can. See. Can you? Yes. Very well. Yes. So, yes, so yes, we can. And you have here some of these photographs that I was referring to in the course of his political career. And then, of course, after he retired from it uh, in, in 1910 and, and uh, undertook a completely different adventure in Pondicherry. So let's begin with a few very basic facts, which uh, many of you will know, uh, but we have to remember it's important that, you know, at the age of, of seven, Shumri was totally uprooted from India, uprooted from Indian languages, India's environment and culture. And was brought up as a completely anglicized, as he himself said, uh, boy in England. Eventually, of course, reaching uh, success in his studies in, in King's College, Cambridge, and making strenuous efforts to get disqualified from the ICS uh, to, for which he had qualified because he did not want to serve the British administration. Um, so, so this is a very brief background. And then we see that immediately on his return to India, where he joined the Baroda State Service under the Maharaja Gaikwad, um, we find that he immediately starts expressing his views on the need for India's struggle against uh, the British rule. He was invited to a series, New Lamps for Old in Indu Prakash. And uh, we find that he uses very strong language uh, where uh, he does not uh, hesitate to criticize the then prevailing Indian National Congress, which was in, in his view, simply begging for crumbs uh, from the British rule. Very minor reforms uh, and not something that would uh, allow India to flourish. So this is his, one of his very first declarations at the age of 21, after, soon after reaching India, where he writes, our actual enemy is not any force exterior to ourselves, but our own crying weaknesses, our cowardice, our selfishness, our hypocrisy, our purblind sentimentalism. Now you see how he is not trying to blame the British. Uh, he will, of course, once uh, from time to time uh, and, and more than once in his political career, but he's actually shifting the gaze inward on the fact, which is something that Swami Vivekananda had also done before him, or at the same time, at this precise period of time, and which was, you know, to say that if we're strong enough, British rule is not something that, that we should be worried about. It would, it would automatically reach its, its end. So this is uh, one of his first messages and the series was discontinued precisely because there were complaints from some of the Congress stalwarts to the editor of this series that you know, this young man is using inappropriate uh, language which is uh, almost insulting to the Congress and, and uh, dangerous also because it will invite uh, you know, the wrath of our, our rulers. So uh, he discontinued it and wrote, wrote on other things like Bankim Chandra Chatterjee, like uh, Kalidasa's poetry and uh, all, all in fact um, authors that he came to study on his own. It was quite remarkable that he studied much of Sanskrit, much of his own uh, mother tongue 
forgotten mother tongue, Bengali, on his own, occasionally with some tutors, but rediscovering pretty much on his own uh, all the foundations of classical Indian culture. And we see here the Baroda State College, as it was in, in these days, of course, it is now integrated uh, in, in the MS University. I've heard some complaints uh, that uh, his office, which you can find on the first floor of this dome, I visited it some years ago, is not very, very well maintained. I hope during this 150th birth anniversary, there'll be some effort to do justice to the space that he occupied in, in this state college eventually as its acting principal um, before he shifted to a different scene, as we will see shortly. This is uh, a picture showing him with some of his students. Uh, the celebrated K. M. Munshi was one of them, and, and several others attained you know, some high achievements in life and uh, testified to his extremely unconventional ways of teaching, which is something we also need to take note of because he was deeply dissatisfied with you know, the university system as it existed. In fact, he wrote at that time, or very shortly thereafter, that uh, his, um, the reasons for his dissatisfaction and the fact that the imported British system of education, whatever its uh, positive features, <clears throat> maybe in, in England or, or in the West, uh, but in the way it was practiced in India was actually harmful. And this is what he wrote. It is a fundamental and deplorable error by which we in this country have confused education with the acquisition of knowledge. Please reflect upon this powerful statement. Much as we have lost as a nation, we have always preserved our intellectual alertness, quickness, and originality. But even this last gift is threatened by our university system. And if it goes, it will be the beginning of irretrievable degradation and final extinction. Whether we have uh, improved the system since then is highly debatable. In fact, the new education policy is um, quite in tune with Shermindo's indictment uh, of, of the first decade of the 20th century. And, and it looks as if uh, everything remains to be done in some ways. Uh, of course, there has been occasional progress, but uh, we, we have not been able to move away from this concept of acquisition of knowledge, which according to Shermindo is not education, not its purpose. We'll come back very briefly to this, but now he had to practice what he preached. And, you know, many of us preach, but don't practice. And this is what Shiramindo disliked. And uh, he was consistent in his be beliefs and his practices. And therefore, when he was invited to Bengal in 1905 uh, to join this experiment, which opened up in 1906, of the Bengal National College as the first Swadeshi educational institution of any dimension. There were very tiny attempts before. He had to accept. And he resigned his job from the Barula State College to take at maybe one third or one fourth of the salary he was getting in Barula, take up the principalship, uh, the first principal of this Bengal National College, which today is, is reabsorbed in the Jaudhapur University in, in Kolkata. Um, this was a challenging work. Everything needed to be built. He invited a lot of scholars whose names are, are you know, household names in history and culture and had to chalk out an entire syllabus, himself teaching many topics from geography to history to French to, to English literature and so on. And, uh, and uh, at the same time, as he was following his semi-clandestine political work, trying to revivify a certain number of secret societies from Maharashtra, from Gujarat, from Bengal, and coordinate them so that they would work in concert. Uh, this was, let us say, uh, on his own admission, only half successful. Nevertheless, it prepared the ground for the major political awakening that took place after the partition of Bengal by Lord Curzon in 1905. And 
there we found not only Bengalis, but uh, a number of Indians in many parts of, of, of the country rebelling against this partition and using it as a ferment to propel nationalist ideas towards perhaps the concept of independence. And indeed, once this journal, this daily, English daily, Bande Mataram, taking over the mantra that Ban Kim had given to the nation, opened up, it was founded by Bipin Chandrapal. Uh, immediately, Bipin Chandrapal asked uh, Shiromino or Arumindo Ghosh, as he was known in those days, to take up its editorship, which he did. Again, semi-clandestinely. Uh, his name was not printed on the paper. And, uh, but then he used it to in immediately project a comprehensive and very well articulated, he and his colleagues, he was not alone, there were four or five other major writers who had joined this team, this integrated comprehensive idea of, of why and how India needed to develop its own national ideals, which could not be, happen under British rule, and therefore why it needed independence from British rule. So this was articulated by him for the perhaps very first time so boldly uh, in September 1906, where from these old, now decrepit offices of Bande Mataram in Kolkata, he wrote the attainment of absolute national autonomy. It is this alone that will settle down this movement. 1906, uh, you know, is, is um, 23 years before the Lahore Declaration of the Indian National Congress uh, in, in 1929, when finally the Congress reconciled itself to declaring the ideal of independence. We are two decades earlier, and this was Shiromino's bold assertion. You will notice that he does not use the word independence because immediately the paper would have been sued for sedition, uh, but absolute national autonomy is pretty much the same. And in fact, the paper uh, will be sued for sedition, especially after Shumino articulates a fourfold strategy in Bande Mataram. We are used to thinking that Mahatma Gandhi was the first to speak of passive resistance and uh, you know, boycott and Swadeshi and so on. It is not the case. Everything was articulated very clearly in, in 1906-1907 in Bande Mataram. And Shirmino's uh, series um, uh, on, on uh, it is called the Doctrine of Passive Resistance. It is, I think, three articles or four articles, uh, which I think should be read by, by every uh, student of, of modern Indian history, and perhaps every student uh, in India, uh, because we can see how, what the depth of his vision right then at that time. There were four pillars. The first, of course, was Swaraj. And he was clever, if I may say so, to use a word that had been whispered to Dadabai Nauruji in the 1906 Calcutta session of the Congress. Dadabai Nauruji wasn't sure what he himself meant by Swaraj, but at least he uttered that word, that this is the objective of, of the National Congress. Swadeshi, I think I don't need to dwell upon this, boycott, because you cannot promote Swadeshi without first boycotting British goods, and national education, because of his background, his experiment with British university education, as he had seen it at close range in, in um, uh, Gujarat, uh, he knew that in India, and this is now his fresh declaration, we have been cut off by a mercenary and soulless education from all our ancient roots of culture and tradition. Something which very interestingly is, is echoed in the national education policy. If you will read it, you will see that there are echoes of this statement. So this was a powerful agenda, which was taken up in a slightly disorganized manner here and there in India, and which did fuel a, a, a nationalist spirit and, um, and, and therefore we should remember those, those pioneers. Uh, now, um, 
I said that he wanted to avoid uh, Bande Mataram being sued for sedition. Well, he could not. And uh, eventually the British did put a case for sedition and which prompted Sir Mindo to resign from his position as principal of the college because he didn't want, uh, you know, his being prosecuted for another activity to harm the college in any way. So here you see him garlanded by the students and the teachers at this college um, on 23rd of August, 1907, where, um, so 120 years ago, almost exactly, where his speech, and there is no time, unfortunately, to dwell upon it. I would advise you to read it. It's, it's another gospel of, of what is the future mission of, of India and how India's children should serve her, their mother. And uh, um, he was actually acquitted in this uh, sedition case for the simple reason that the British could not prove that he had been uh, the editor and the author of all those anonymous articles. <clears throat> now, as I told you, he promoted very strong ideas of independence. And in this, Kal Bal Gangadhar Tilak and many others uh, were absolutely on the same wavelength. So a year after Dadabai Nauruji promoted the ideal of, of uh, Swaraj uh, in the Calcutta session, we move now to Surat, where the old guard, the conservative wing of the Indian National Congress had decided that they would suppress this voice because they found it too dangerous. Uh, it's a long story and very, very exciting and interesting uh, with people throwing their shoes at um, Tilak or at some of the old guard. Uh, but the upshot of it was that after some chaotic scenes, the, the extremists, as they were called by the British, uh, but they called themselves the nationalists, split away from the uh, Indian National Congress and conducted their own session, which you see here being presided over by Shermindo um, uh, amidst this fairly chaotic atmosphere. And, and we see um, uh, Tilak here speaking, standing and speaking. Let us move on. And the upshot of this period, brief, but very active and extremely important uh, as at least a catalyst of Shomindu is, is summed up beautifully by Long Minto, Viceroy of India, who described him as the most dangerous man we have to deal with at present. Sir Edward Baker, Lieutenant Governor of Bengal, added the following, I attribute the spread of seditious doctrines to him personally in a greater degree than to any other single individual in Bengal or possibly in India. So this was the estimate, and, and I believe it is quite correct, of Shermindo's contribution, of course, seen from the other side, but uh, his, his uh, very important, though still little known and poorly highlighted role uh, in the uh, freedom movement. As you all know, he was arrested in the Alipo bomb case, uh, for which actually he was not responsible. It was his younger brother, Barindra Ghosh, who had, you know, uh, prepared uh, uh, young uh, young men for the, you know, the, the the certain terrorist acts. Well, terrorist is the term, of course, that the British used. Uh, they considered that these acts of throwing bombs at some judges or some public figures were justified. Uh, to attain uh, India's independence. By this time, Shomino had actually moved away from these methods, which he had initially believed in, because he realized that this is not going to work and the Indian public is not prepared sufficiently to rise in support of such actions. So anyhow, he was in jail for a whole year. I think we just heard about this period of his life. I will not dwell upon it. Uh, this is a view of the Alipo jail, uh, the cell where he was in prison for a whole year. Uh, finally, finally, he was released, acquitted by the king, uh, Kingsford. Uh, no, I'm sorry, the king was Beechcroft. Uh, because Beechcroft, who was his ICA, ICS student mate in Cambridge, could not believe that Shermindo would have 
such a cultured, uh, you know, person who had actually beaten him, the judge, in uh, exams of Greek and Latin in Cambridge, he could not believe that such a fine scholar could be responsible for such uh, throwing of bombs and other acts. Uh, moreover, again, the prosecution and a very uh, uh, costly uh, prosecutor was hired by the government. His name was Norton, if I remember well. Uh, again, you know, argued on the basis of unsigned articles. So when the judge Beechcroft asked Norton, how do you know that these are authored by Oromido Ghosh? The answer was, your honor, when we have to run to our English dictionary to find out the meanings of some words, we know that Aurobindo Ghosh is the author. So there are some delightful moments in, in, the, in the Aleppo trial, but the upshot was this acquittal and the subsequent um, speech here, famous speech of Uttarpara at Uttarpara uh, upon uh, Shomino's release. You can see Bipin Chandrapal here, and of course, Shermino is, is on the other side. He was felicitated and he gave this uh, very moving testimony of what happened to him in the jail and also how he's convinced that India is rising for Sanatana Dharma and that India's nationalism is to be equated to Sanatana Dharma. And it is not just to become an independent nation like any other. So this insistence on the vision of India comes again and again, again in this uh, new weekly, which he started upon his release, the Karma Yogin. And I just use this quotation in brief, the spirit and ideals of India had come to be confined in a mold, which however beautiful was too narrow and slender to bear the mighty burden of our future. So see how he's always self-critical. He will be quite aware of the, beauties and deep values of Indian traditions, tra classical thought, yet he is not satisfied. He considers that at some point, India declined, the, the creative power declined, the intellectual artistic contributions declined, and this mold uh, had to be broken, and even the idea lost for a while in order to be recovered free of constraint and limitation. The mold is broken. We must remold in larger outlines and with a richer content. And therefore, Shermino is definitely not a traditionalist. And those who try to portray him as in a simply, you know, uh, logical continuous sequence uh, emerging from ancient Indian traditions, I believe I do him a disservice. The, the, the departure from from these lines is to be well understood. It doesn't mean that he rejected whatever had been achieved in the past. He himself wrote extensively about it in his articles on the foundations of, of Indian culture uh, later on, uh, but nevertheless, he could not advocate a simple return to those um, ancient achievements. He kept insisting that India has to move on and look beyond. Uh, now, of course, his departure from the political scene is well known. People say he took refuge in Pondicherry. Well, no, he was asked to move to Pondicherry by an Adesh, by a message which he heard, first of all, moving to Chandanagar near Calcutta, and then on to Pondicherry, which he reached clandestinely. And you see him here early on. This is not from 1910. This is a couple of years later with some of his former fellow revolutionists who joined him in Pondicherry. And then we have a few, quite a few statements. I will not take time to, uh, to, to uh, list them all. Uh, they are very important, but I have only selected two or three. And the first is this, <clears throat> that in 1920 already, he's quite convinced that India will achieve independence. He can see that now the seed has grown it will not be suppressed. But what bothers him is not when or how it will achieve independence, but the question of what India is going to do with its self-determination, how it will use its freedom, on what lines it will determine its future. Again, he wanted India not to be just any ordinary nation. India had a mission, had a role in this world, 
and it had to fulfill it, and therefore it had to be different. I believe that the main cause of India's weakness is not subjection, not poverty, nor a lack of spirituality of dharma, but a diminution of thought power, the spread of ignorance in the motherland of knowledge. Everywhere I see an inability or unwillingness to think, incapacity of thought or thought phobia. Would he say the same thing today in India? I will leave it to you to decide. And then we move on to the last phase uh, because I have to cut short uh, this whole long journey and his own long involvement. First of all, this reminder that our past with all its faults and defects should be sacred to us, but the claims of the future with its immediate possibilities should be still more sacred. So Trumino is not a unconditional advocate of, of India's past, however glorious he accepts it to have been. So I, I end with this last statement in 1948, uh, when he was given some award by uh, uh, University of Andhra. Uh, he did not, of course, travel there, but he accepted this and then made a long declaration, which is perhaps one of the last ones on India and her mission. And he writes, it would be a tragic irony of fate if India were to throw away her spiritual heritage at the very moment when in the rest of the world, there is more and more a turning towards her for spiritual help and a saving light. This must not and will surely not happen, but it cannot be said that the danger is not there. So he was quite lucid. He was not an idealist. He was not, a, as he himself declared, um, powerless pacifist. Uh, he was a bold visionary and uh, also someone who uh, tried to pull down the energies of the future. No doubt we will win through, but we must not disguise from ourselves the fact that after these long years of subjection and its cramping and impairing effects, a great inner as well as outer liberation and change, a vast inner and outer progress is needed if we are to fulfill India's true destiny. And please note that he is writing one year after India achieved independence. And he is telling us that we need to, to make a vast inner and outer progress. Have we made it by now 75 years later? I'm not sure in every field that Shomida would be satisfied. Uh, this is, of course, my own opinion, but we have to revisit his words and meditate upon them. I will end uh, with this uh, thank you coming to us from 4,500 years ago, and also the fact that um, all these excerpts and many, many more connected to Shomino's vision of India and, and its rebirth are found in this book, uh, which I brought out a few years ago in a fresh and last edition. Thank you very much. Sir, we are extremely um, happy to have you, but we are extremely also upset that you have cut it short only to respect the time schedule. I mean, um, I am like really a little bit stunned because <laughs> uh, it was such a nice flow of uh, discussion that you have begun, but um, that that actually underlines that, sir, in future we might, you might have to give us one more opportunity to listen to you, and we will definitely get back to you on that. And another thing that I wanted to tell you, sir, about uh, what you said about Jatiya Siksha Parishad, National Council of Education, um, which was founded in 1906 with, um, uh, with the help of Raja Subhat Chandra Malik and uh, Rabindranath Tagore and Subhas Bose and all eminent Bengali nationalists were uh, involved in that. And you, of course, know the name, but I would just tell you once again that we had another very original thinker of our time, um, uh, Binoy Kumar Sarkar, who was also associated with National Bengal of Council. And therefore, in last couple of months, I had the opportunity to do some basic research. 
in fact bengal uh, national council of education had a an initiative called bengal national school and college of which maharshi arobindo was the principal and that was later on uh, kind of uh, converted into jadavpur university whereas the national council of education still exists and i personally had a discussion with them to perhaps uh, uh, revive the nationalist tradition that was started in the beginning of last century and we will solicit your uh, participation in in one thing that we are trying to do um, perhaps uh, i will talk about it to you on a completely different note but thank you sir thanks a lot um it was such a lovely uh, uh, like you know journey of rishi aurobindo's life and the moment you said that the garland uh, that you see on rishi aurobindo it was given by the bengal national school and college 1907 uh actually we have seen this in im- image but we didn't actually know why he was wearing gar- garlands thank you i mean it's a very uh, very precious uh, intervention for us and now i will uh, if i may tato just a second sorry uh professor dani no i must thank you personally and profusely for this wonderful intervention we have thank not you. had enough of you and as tato rightly said we should legally look forward to another session of involving you with our projects and seeking your guidance here and as i had mentioned in in my intervention uh, we might we are looking at including studies on aurobindo and his philosophy in our own curriculum on you know français langue étrangère because fleur in india takes on a completely new dimension and we'd be delighted to have your guidance when we develop our curriculum on that so you'd have to give us some time on that it's an ardent request from us at igno sir thank you dr deepan vita thank you thank you yo mebo अस्म काम भारत भूमि न खलु मृत्यु का खंडम अपि तु महाशक्ति ही देवी भवानी प्रत्येकम भारतीय यदि ईमा ईमाम शाश्वत जननी हृदय रूरम कृत्व समस्त भेद भावम विस्रित्य समस्त संकीर्णतम दूरीकृत्य तस्य सेवार्थे अग्रेसर भवती तरि पुनोरेत भारत भारतवर्ष समृद्ध समुज्जल भविष्य यमेव भविष्य मातृशक्ति सत्यपोषणा मातृभूमे समुचित पूजा यमेव श्री अरविंद विरचित भवानी भारतीय काव्य चिरंतन वाणी दीज आर द लाइन्स फ्रॉम एन एसे कॉल्ड भवानी भारती श्री अरविंद विचरितम राष्ट्रभक्ति परकम संस्कृत संस्कृत काव्यम एंड दिस इज रिटन बाय एन आउट आउटस्टैंडिंग स्कॉलर इन संस्कृत एंड हु इज प्रेजेंट विथ अस टुडे एंड आई वुड लाइक टू नाउ इंट्रोड्यूस डॉक्टर संपदानंद मिश्रा in fact you have seen that there are hundreds of articles around the world written in our times in french in german in polish in english in bengali in hindi in marathi on maharshi aurobindo but this particular article written in our times in sanskrit was by dr sampadanand mishra dr sampadanand mishra is working now as the director of center of human sciences Rishihud University and teaches at the Rashtram School of Public Leadership Rishihud University Sonipat he holds the position of dean in the same university needless to mention that he has lectured several uh, at several prestigious universities and plat- platforms across the world in addition dr mishra is also a devotee of maharshi aurobindo and the mother and as you have already heard the wonderful essay he has written and um, uh, professor mishra and my colleagues from sanskrit department i am not a habitual reader of sanskrit so please forgive me for the little flaws i had in my reading recipient of maharshi badrani badrania 
uh, Badarayan uh, Fast Samman, which is the highest award in India on Sanskrit from the President of India. He has received it in the year 2011. But besides awards and other things, I must tell you that Dr. Mishra, apart from being an erudite, an academic, he is also an institution builder. He has founded and launched first ever 24 hour Sanskrit radio called Divya Vani Sanskrit Radio. And he has also founded Sanskrita Bala Sahitya Parishad with the aim of creating, evaluating, and propagating children's literature in Sanskrit, which is a complete new segment. And he did it in back in 2014. Recently, Dr. Mishra has launched a monthly e-magazine for children in Sanskrit called Saptavarna. Dr. Mishra was conferred the Pandit Dindayal Upadhyay recognition for re-engineering India 2020 by Rethink India organization. Without further delay, now I would call upon you, sir. Actually, I wanted to introduce you with the term that you have used about Sanskrit the logic and magic of divine language Sanskrit. And now I invite the inventor of the, the, the person who coined this wonderful term, logic and magic of divine language Sanskrit, Dr. Mishra, please. Namaskar to all of you. <clears throat> and uh, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Bhattacharyji, for this wonderful introduction. I have been listening to you. Uh, what has fascinated me, uh, just I'll take a few seconds to mention this, and I must mention this, that this whole team at IGNO uh, organizing this uh, conference, uh, uh, you all have gone so deep to study Sri Aurobindo and then prepare yourself so well in presenting, whether giving introduction to the speakers or giving uh, a little concept note. It was really amazing to see how much sincere effort has gone into organizing this, this very seminar. So I uh, really thank you. And then I'm really happy to be a part of this in uh, sharing my little thought on Sri Aurobindo, his uh, uh, thoughts on national uh, education, uh, nation building, and then how language fits into it, or what was his idea on language. So before I move ahead, I would like uh, to uh, pay my respect to all the authorities at IGNU here and all my previous speakers, uh, Professor Michel Daninoji and uh, uh, Jaintira Viji and uh, Vidya ji spoke really well. I was listening to her and all others who were speaking here. And let me do a little invocation uh, before I proceed. So as a part of uh, uh, my ritual, uh, paying my homage to Sri Aurobindo. Oh. Anandamai Chaitanyamai Satyamai Parami Anandamai Chaitanyamai Satyamai Parami This is a mantra which is given by Sri Aurobindo. He is the Rishi of this mantra. And in this mantra, Sri Aurobindo himself invokes the Divine Mother as Anandamai, Chaitanyamai, Satyamai, and Parama. So she is the Supreme Divine Mother, full of Anand, full of Sat, full of Chit. Referring to the Divine Mother, Satchidananda Swarupa. I purposefully selected this mantra and then would like to mention about it right in the beginning. The Sri Aurobindo remains incomplete 
without the mention of the mother, his spiritual collaborator, whom Sri Aurobindo himself called the Divine Mother. And the mother, also, uh, the Divine Mother, <clears throat> just one minute. The Divine Mother herself <clears throat> said, without him, I exist not, and without me, he is unmanifest. So it is two, biologically two separate bodies, but it is one consciousness. So whatever we get from Sri Aurobindo and whatever we get from the mother and whatever writings and teachings are available, it is coming from the same consciousness, same supramental consciousness realized by both of them and then brought it down to fix on the earth consciousness. So then the real work of yoga, the real work of transformation of the human nature can take place. Coming to the topic today, Sri Aurobindo himself, as it was discussed earlier also, Sri Aurobindo himself was a, a polyglot in the sense that he had the knowledge of more than 15 languages, Greek, Latin, Spanish, French. Even he taught French, he translated so many uh, passages uh, written by the mother into English, from French to English. He knew Sanskrit, Hindustani, Bengali, Gujarati, Marathi, Tamil, the most difficult language people say, but Sri Aurobindo could master it after coming to Pondicherry and they learnt Tamil. What is more interesting is that Sri Aurobindo had his entire education uh, through English medium. And as we all know about uh, Sri Aurobindo's birth and his childhood, that he was not allowed to come in contact with any Indian or anything Indian. That was a strict instruction from his father, Krishnadan Ghosh. Why? Because when he returned, Krishnadan Ghosh returned from England, that uh, he was not allowed to stay in the village without going through certain rituals, which he was not uh, uh, comfortable with. He was asked to tonsure his head. He was asked to drink the cow dung uh, water and then uh, so many things as a part of Prayaschita because he had crossed ocean. So that's the kind of uh, uh, practice which was there uh, in India of that time, mostly in the uh, rural areas. So he said, like, if this is what is India, I would not like my children to come in contact with anything Indian in India. So that's how he sent them to Darjeeling for their early education. And then from there, he shifted all, all his children to England, where 14 years of Banavasa, you can compare it with Sri Ramachandra's Banavasa, 14 years in England. And then later, when uh, there was too much uh, happening from the British side, the torture, so Sri Aurobindo's father, who did not wish them to come in contact with anything India, know about India, started sending them the newspaper clips, making them aware of what was happening here in India by the British. And Sri Aurobindo also uh, knowingly, like a uh, little bit of his life, a sketch that uh, how he failed himself in the ICS examination because he did not want to become a part of the British government. And he also was involved in that, what, what was called the Cambridge Majlis. So they had formed certain groups there to raise their voice against uh, the British people. So what was interesting is that Sri Aurobindo right from the beginning was very deeply passionate about learning many new languages and he excelled in, uh, in all that he learned, the Greek, Latin, and then he was praised highly by the authorities of the schools uh, when he joined Cambridge and started writing poetry in Greek and Latin, which he learned from his personal instructor, Druid, when he was handed over to uh, by his father to uh, the caretaker there. So uh, he had no idea about his own mother tongue. Little bit he could 
learn because he had to pass the ICS exam as a part of that, but very, very uh, poor Bengali knowledge he had. Later, when he comes back to India, and there is an interesting thing which I must say as a passing remark that after 14 years when Sri Aurobindo uh, landed on India, when he touched, he, he did pranam to Bharat Mata, and he says that when he touched the uh, uh, you know, Mother India, he put his feet on motherland. He says that a great calm descended into him, which remained with him for a long time. He carried that peace. And because this land is a land of silence, the land of rishis, the land of peace. And all that is contributed by our rishis, it came from that state of silence. And Sri Aurobindo carried that silence. And perhaps that was one of the reasons why he excelled in every field, because he carried that silence always in him. And that was his power. So whatever Sri Aurobindo has spoken, it is as if his silence has spoken. They're, they're not, and these words have immense power to make us silent. So whether he has spoken it in Bengali, whether he has spoken it in French or whether he has spoken it in English or Sanskrit or Tamil or using any other language. So the language part itself is coming from a state of silence. And very interestingly that he started uh, learning Bengali uh, in, in Baroda period, learned a little bit of Gujarati and Marathi, uh, Hindustani uh, and Sanskrit on his own so fascinating that we all struggle right from my childhood I'm learning Sanskrit throughout the uh, academic career I have Sanskrit but still we struggle with passages with the mantras from the Vedas Upanishads or sutras from Janakya we struggle to understand the real intent of the words in general we can understand certain aspects of the words but what it means in a particular context, it is very, very difficult. But Sri Aurobindo, with no idea of any Indian language, no idea of Sanskrit, just picks up the Naladamayanti episode of the Mahabharata and starts reading it 100 times, 200 times, and then he gets into the spirit of Sanskrit. How did it happen? It is still a miracle, still a mystery. But probably he was meant to do that Maybe like us came Munshiji and uh, uh, K.D. Setnaji and many others and all of the devotees of Sri Aurobindo regard him as an avatar. So maybe like avatars have the power to do and undo or what the human, uh, normal people cannot do with much effort, they can easily do it. Perhaps that is something true about Sri Aurobindo. So he could master Sanskrit language, not only master, he could enter into the very spirit of the language, could uh, read the entire Ramayana, entire Mahabharat, entire Panini, and the whole gamut of classical literature he learned. What is interesting, again, that he comes back to Pondicherry after, you know, like the whole history, I don't need to go. Like Pondicherry is the cave of his tapasya. Until he came to Pondicherry, he had no contact with the Veda. He had no contact with Tamil language. So when he reached here, he started learning Tamil. And he says that it was that, the knowledge of Tamil, which gave him a lot of ideas about a new science of language. New science of language. Sri Aurobindo has given to us with regard to language. What he has done, the tremendous amount of research work that he did with regard to creating a new science of language and what was the need for creating that new science of language that he speaks of. It comes from, he gets triggered when he enters into the very format of the very structure of the Tamil language. One of the, uh, you know, ancient and uh, primitive languages like Sanskrit, Greek and Latin. And Sri Aurobindo considered Greek, Latin, Tamil, Sanskrit, these four languages as cognate languages sister languages coexisting and sharing their experiences with each other. At some point, he says, like, if Sanskrit has lost something, Tamil has preserved. If Sanskrit and Tamil have lost, Greek and Latin have preserved. Greek and Latin have lost, Sanskrit has preserved, or Tamil has preserved. So this is how he showed his philological research. And then he, uh, if, if you read his writings, the 
modern linguists and philologists will, will not agree with him because he never believed in uh, you know gave so much not believed but never gave so much of importance to uh, other forms of linguistics uh, like sociolinguistics psycholinguistics and all the different branches of linguistics they may be having there uh, and certainly they have their own role to play but uh, uh, sri aurobindo as a philologist he say the only the only business of a philologist is to deep dive deep to find out the true history of the world, true history of the world. And he was forced while writing, I'm sure when those writing, and we have seen, uh, I was reading somewhere that uh, someone was uh, mentioning that most of the uh, non-speaking, I mean, non-English speaking, that, that English is not a mother tongue, like wherever it has traveled. So for example, like any Indians have done uh, many great works in English, though English is not native language of ours. So, but the Indians have performed uh, far better than the uh, native speakers in creating good amount of literature. For example, like you take uh, Rabindranath Tagore's writings in English, like when he translates into English. And some uh, there's very, very uh, interesting part that when uh, Rabindranath Ji was uh, uh, he, he submitted his uh, thing. Uh, before that, he showed it to, I forget the name of that uh, a scholar or, or uh, the officer who was here uh, in the British government. So he showed it to him that, you know, please go through uh, this translation of mine, Gitanjali. So he suggested a uh, few changes. He said that, you know, from English point of view, these are the uh, places, uh, words uh, you must replace. So Rabindranath Ji, he accepted that, but when it was uh, um, uh, reviewing for the Nobel Prize, so he said it is such a fabulous translation and while going through it, I had problem at four places. And he pointed out those four places exactly, which was suggested by the British officer to replace. And then Rabindranath Ji said, uh, okay, these were my original words, but I was suggested that I should replace these words by this. So the, the review of poet, one of the greatest poets in English, he said that these words which you originally put, they fit more well because they go more naturally than what is suggested you do for the replacement. So please change it. So again, he had to come back to the original. So anyway, Ravindranath Tagore also uh, made a great offering to Sri Aurobindo. And then we, we know like when he came, uh, I mean, when he wrote this letter to Sri Aurobindo that, uh, hey, Aurobindo, you know, Aurobindo uh, pronoun. So uh, it, it's a very emotional uh, letter. And uh, Rabindranath Tagore ji, when he met uh, uh, the mother in Japan, so he had uh, uh, offered, I mean, uh, gifted the typewriter uh, machine that he used, which is still there in the ashram. Uh, in the exhibition in Sri Smriti. Anyway, so that's, that's just a passing remark. So coming back to the language part, Sri Aurobindo did tremendous amount of research on various languages because it was easy for him because he was a polyglot. He had thorough knowledge of Greek, Latin, French, and uh, these things. So what he did in his research, that he compiled words from Greek, Latin, Tamil, and Sanskrit. So if you look at his notebooks, they, those are put in four columns, Greek, Latin, Tamil, Sanskrit. So he would take these words and then go back to find out the root sound of the words. Now see, these root sounds mattered. So in sure when those philological ideas or the thesis or hypothesis, which he has submitted in the form of his thoughts on philology, so he says, unless and until we go back to the root sound and then look at the fundamental experiences associated with the root sounds, there is no solution to find it out the true history of a particular world. His entire interpretation of the Veda, Upanishad, Ramayana, Mahabharata, Gita, and Upanishads is entirely based on this root theory, the new science of language. A little anecdote I will uh, just you know mention here when uh, <clears throat> uh, Sri Aurobindo was here, many learned Vedic scholars used to sit in his class during evening 
and learn the Veda afresh from, from him. And once uh, Swami Subramanya Bharati Ji, he asked Sri Aurobindo that, look, we all are so well versed in the Veda. The Veda is at the tip of the tongue. 10,500 mantras of Rig Veda. So that's how the traditional scholars, they learned the Veda from the Gurukula. So how is it that everything that you speak and the way you interpret is very different from what we have learned, what we know so far? So that is why we get hooked to you to listen to uh, the interpretation of the Veda. So Sri Aurobindo, uh, very silently with a, I mean, he uh, doesn't smile so easily, but still carrying a smile on his face. So he said uh, that Sri Krishna has shown me a new science of language, based on which the new interpretation of the Veda and other Shastras will be done. What is that new science of language that Sri Aurobindo has received from Sri Krishna is reviving the root theory which once Yaskacharya spoke about it, but he has elaborated it. He says that by uh, this whole new science of language, one can get into not just the history of the words, but we can recover the fundamental experiences of the humanity. And if we contemplate on the fundamental experiences of the uh, root sounds, the seed sounds, so for Sri Aurobindo, what is important is the seed sounds, how the language flowers in Sri Aurobindo's scheme of philology, that everything begins with the seed sounds. So the letters that we have in the Sanskrit Varnamala, the alphabet, starting from A to H, these are the seed sounds, the Vija Aksharas. So from here, that one has to uh, uh, move and the language has flourished from the seed sounds to the root sounds, to the root words and the formed words. So what is important in, what is the decisive factor in uh, the semantics? So for example, like a particular word has so many meanings. To, in order to understand that, one has to go back to the root sound and see what are the fundamental experiences associated with the root sound. Not only root sounds, one has to still break it into the seed form. So for example, like while explaining the Agni mantra in the Rig Veda, the word Agni, Sri Aurobindo goes to this extent of explaining what does A mean, what does Ga mean, what does Na mean, what does E mean, what are the fundamental experiences associated with, what are the sensations associated with these sounds, the fundamental sensations. He takes those into consideration separately and then looks at what is common in them and how these four words, a, ga, na, e, means fire. And what else the fire can mean, Agni can mean. And it is, it is so interesting and so deep that based on this philology of his, he has interpreted more than 5,000 mantras of Rig Veda. More than 5,000 mantras of Rig Veda. And all the principal Upanishads he has interpreted based on this. And if you go through Sri Aurobindo's writings, and he is a very language conscious, his language is like, that's what many people complain that, oh, Sri Aurobindo is too difficult. Actually, Sri Aurobindo is not too difficult. One has to just enter into the mold of the rhythm of his language. So once you get into that rhythm, he's so interesting that you read him like a poetry. Only poets can appreciate him. His prose is like poetry. His prose is like poetry. That's what happens. Like when you read uh, Taitiriya Upanishad, it's all in prose, but it sounds like poetry. So that mantric force, the intensity of the rhythm, rhythm, the intensity of the thought substance, the intensity of soul's vision, he has translated into all his writings. That is why his writings from a language point of view is so uh, carrying these three intensities is, is mantric. And the mantra has these three intensities, the intensity of the rhythm, the intensity of the thought substance, and the intensity of the soul's vision. So when that happens, any language can be elevated from its level of inertia to the level of mantra. And when Sri Aurobindo thought about a language that should lead the nation, when he speaks about the national, national system of education, 
so he 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 focuses on this aspect he says that all other indian languages even the mother has spoken about it that all other indian languages they carry in their seed form the forces of uh, the sounds in sanskrit and because of that in india the solution that he had given for the national system of education and nation building that the education in india at the primary level until the child is 12 years old the entire education must be given through the mother tongue and here in the sri aurobindo international center of education in pondicherry which was established in 1941 42 so here this formula is followed that every child who is admitted here has to learn four languages it begins with french and sanskrit both being true scientific languages and every subject here the mathematics and science subjects are taught through french and literature geography and all other subjects history is taught through english and mother tongue is compulsory whether someone is coming from tamil nadu or west bengal or odisha or from somewhere so mother tongue is compulsory they have to study all students here they have to study the mother tongue and sanskrit is also compulsory that they have to, at a certain stage it becomes uh, optional but it is compulsory to a maximum period but every child entering here getting admitted starts learning uh, the education begins with two languages french and sanskrit which is compulsory and all scientific uh, subjects are taught through french and that's why the mother says that french is good for science and math english is good for history geography and all other uh, subjects and mother tongue is beautiful that it helps in the inner progress of the child in structuring his brain his power of understanding original thinking and everything is very naturally develops in the child if mother tongue if everything is taught through the mother tongue or one has that sense and love for the mother tongue because it's native to someone and then she says sanskrit is good for all sanskrit is good for all whether you teach science subject mathematics or history geography or anything sanskrit is good and they expected sri aurobindo and the mother expected sanskrit to become the national language of india sanskrit not from a scholastic point of view but a simple sanskrit depicting the very heart of india very atman of india so sanskrit indeed was i mean they felt that it is the soul of india and the soul of india has given expression to itself through this language for several thousands of years and mark shirvind has a long passage when he speaks about the majestic nature the grandeur of this language uh, sanskrit language he spoke extensively and he, he fills the whole passage with attributes and attributes for sanskrit so that is that is the kind of relationship that he had with sanskrit he said that it is it has to be the simple language the root sounds of which is behind all indian languages so such a simple sanskrit should become the national language of india the sanskrit that one finds in the ramayana which is the simple most sanskrit the sanskrit that one finds in the mahabharat though mahabharat and ramayana also has their difficulty because at present we are so cut off from our own tradition and languages that we find even the simple things difficult for us which is our own is is difficult and the language situation here is extremely difficult and to awaken that spirit of the nation language can play a major role and when we are talking about the language if we can focus on this new science of language that sri aurobindo has spoken by diving deep into the history of the words then you will see that you will forget so for example like a single word in sanskrit or any indian language is so deep and profound in its meaning the word itself is so self explanatory that we don't need any dictionary we don't need any other help any uh, outer help to understand the deeper meanings of many things the word itself is self explanatory when we say uh, a particular thing like when we say hand it's difficult to explain why this this is called hand but if you are using the word hasta or hath which is coming from hasta 
the word itself is self-explanatory. This is what I have learned from Sri Aurobindo while going through his writings and the way he has presented. So the first question we should ask, and another thing is that here in Indian languages, it allows anyone to ask the question why. Why is it called hasta? One is free to ask. You are not free to ask this question in, a, in an English class. It will be ridiculed or stopped because there is no answer to it. Or if there is any answer also, someone has to find out and then explain convincingly. But a person who has studied Sanskrit or any Indian language with little, you know, uh, deeply can well explain why this is called hasta. One has to go back to the root sound and then find out what does the root sound has means. Now, has means to smile. But then the doubt comes, like if it is smile, why it is not used for the mouth? Why hasta is used for hand? Because hand is not smiling. The mouth is smiling. Okay. So this is again a preconceived mind. How Sri Aurobindo, you know, when we go through his writings, especially on language and the history of the words, that we will see that he makes us free from our preconceived understanding and mind. So hus for us is to smile. We take it in its you know face value that smile means like that. But while designing this language, the rishis have gone deep into like what happens psychologically or emotionally when we smile. So that whole process of smiling, what happens deep inside? When we smile, we don't shrink. We don't become narrow. While smiling, something is opening in us. So has actually means to open, to bloom. Okay. So in Sanskrit, you can very well write a sentence, pushpam hasati. And you should not translate it as the flower is laughing. The flower is blooming. It's the smile of the flower. So hand, because it is that part in us, which you can stretch and then extend to do all the words. So the elephant uses its nose for doing that. That is why that is called hasta. And the elephant is called hasti because it possesses a hat. So you see like how easy and how easily we can connect with our cultural civilizational values through our words. This is what Sri Aurobindo and the mother wanted when they spoke about the history of the world. If we can make our children in our education system language conscious, word conscious, root sound conscious, much of the nation building can happen automatically because we are day to day, we are just speaking. But see, speaking and speaking with linguistic awareness are two different things. We just speak and use language in a very mechanical way. So what is expected is that we need to create that awareness. And Sanskrit and other Indian languages, which are very well connected, they have the ability to create that linguistic awareness, that semantic awareness, that philological awareness in all of us. That is how the nation building can take place through languages. And that is why NEP is giving so much of importance to IKS, Indian knowledge system. And that again has to be taught through the Indian languages. So Bharatiya Bhasha Prajar Samiti, Bharatiya Bhasha Samiti is established to uh, take forward that work. So then there is much awareness about our own languages. Otherwise, today the situation is such that all languages are at risk. India has more than 700 languages, including all dialects and sub-dialects. The richest country in the whole world linguistically. But if you take, for example, I, I recently made a Facebook live uh, presentation that you take simple example of bicycle, the most illiterate man who is repairing bicycle in a rural area who has no education has to depend 100% on English to do his business. Cycle, paddle, bell, seat, seat cover, mudguard, crank, chain, spoke, tube, tire, pump, 100% English. And in none of the Indian languages, though we manufacture here, we use here, bicycle is so common to us, to our life. It is an integral part of our life, but we do not have a single word which we use for bicycle, likewise for other machineries through our Indian languages. Or it doesn't happen in Japan that way. Please remember. It is still a very well developed country. You find difficult 
to communicate to any Japanese person in English. They find it difficult to communicate in English. That is how they have organized their own language and then kept alive that spirit of language, which we are lacking. For us, the Shuddhata of every language has come down to that, that level. I give this example, popular example, which I heard a girl speaking that may to as far as possible pure Hindi bolti hu. May to as far as possible pure Hindi hi bolti hu. So that's the purity that, that we have now with regard to any language, not just Hindi, Odia, Bengali, Tamil. Every region language is at risk because of too much of English. So that is why uh, as a part of my work and then where I was inspired by Sri Aurobindo and the mother, they hooked me like anything when I read one sentence of the mother. She said that like a child born in France has to learn French, a child born in India must learn Sanskrit, must know Sanskrit. That's the identity. Then she said, at least all those who are here must converse in Sanskrit. Is referring to all those who are part of the ashram. So here, if you come to your Aurobindo ashram, most people, they have immense respect for Sanskrit. And the children here, they converse in Sanskrit. That is what is the, uh, you know, the mother has created that. And I was very much attracted by this single sentence. And that defined my life's work, that this is where I work to bring Sanskrit to every child of India. And I have been working for a long time, inspired by Sri Aurobindo and the mother, following their path, making and bringing the simple Sanskrit. Mother said, no simplified Sanskrit, but a simple Sanskrit, which is behind all Indian languages. There's a whole lot of difference between a simple form of language and simplified form of the language. Every language has a simple form of it and has a classical form of it. Okay, so that simple, has to be extracted from the language and then brought into our day-to-day -day life. So this is where I have been working in creating textbooks for children. So if you go to Jaipuriya school in, 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 in Lucknow, where I have created 11 books where Sanskrit, this is perhaps one and only school in India, where we have met Sanskrit compulsory from play school to class eight, and they learn it. The, the, and all the textbooks are free from grammar, shabdarup, dhaturup, and anything. You just learn language. There is joy of learning the language in a natural way. So this is where I have uh, created a Sanskrit Bala Sahitya Parishad. The entire focus is in creating qualitative children's literature in Sanskrit, rhyming songs, songs in Sanskrit. Like in 2018, Kendra Sahitya Academy mm. recognized my book, uh, Shane Shane which is a simple rhyming songs in Sanskrit, very powerfully learned by, all the songs are learned by many children and they sing it easily and learn Sanskrit to it. Last year, I started a magazine for children called Saptavarana. So every month we are coming out with 30 pages. Like we expect that every child can learn just one page a single day, spending 10 to 15 minutes. And then by the time, one completes the whole book, we're ready with new content. And they're very innovatively presented. So then Sanskrit, and if a child knows Sanskrit well, what is most important thing that happens here is that the child develops love for all other languages. Doesn't develop any heteredness for any language. Every language, if we look at the basic principles of the formation of language, they follow certain natural laws and processes. So one should not have any kind of hatredness for any other language. So one should have more love for, if you love your mother tongue truly, you can never hate anyone else's mother tongue. So that hatredness is creating much linguistic issues and problems in our nation. And we must address to it by bringing this awareness and by creating more love for languages in the children right from the childhood. This is where Saptavarna magazine or the textbooks or the different programs which I have created, they have uh, much impact on the children. So Sri Aurobindo, uh, before I conclude, Sri Aurobindo said that a nation or a race, a community which loses its own language cannot live its full life a real life. A nation which loses its own native language, 
own language. But then what is that native language of India that we all need to become aware of that? So any, any language, like any Indian language, any state language is the native language of India because behind all languages, there is one common principle. There is a unifying force which unites us together linguistically and we need to become aware of that unifying force and then percolate into every aspect of our li uh, life wherever language is involved, wherever communication is involved. But beyond communication also, we have to look at the creative force of the language, which Sri Aurobindo always gave importance, the creative power of the language, how the word has power to create. The mantric power of the language, if we can bring that back into our life, into our education, then a true nation building through the language can happen. This is what is a little idea uh, that I shared with you all in the light of Sri Aurobindo and the mother. Once again, thank you, Dhanavad, for giving me this opportunity for sharing my little thought. And, and Dr. Mishra, it's us. We must thank you. And your presentation, I mean, we will hear the vote of thanks in a little while. Um, uh, we regret that we have very little time with you. And uh, I think there is a question from uh, Mr. Prayas Chaturvedi, who would like to ask your question. Sir, please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. I'm audible to all of you. Yes, sir. Uh, first of all, let me... Uh, congratulate the entire team of Galaxy of Igno and especially Dr. Dipanta Shwapur who gave me a chance to, you know, uh, be a party to what has transpired so far. It's a wonderful, wonderful series, especially I thank from the core of my heart to Dr. Dipanta Shwapur for giving me a chance to listen to such an intellectual, you know, discourse by Professor Sampadaran Mishra, Dr. Michel Daniani. Uh, I'm very sorry that I, I, because of certain commitments, I could not join in time. I'm just, I'll just not take much time. But uh, if Professor Sampadan Mishra may permit me to add to what he has given brilliant discourse on, you know, the language uh, Sri Arvindo, uh, that, you know, that master ascetic concentrated on was in a, a sort of dimension of avidya, as we have heard. Avidya means, as we understand, the entrenched understandings of ourselves and with the world. But I'm very sure that such a master craftsman of our nation, he must have definitely left something un, unpronounced or unnoticed or un, uh, uninterpreted. That is the other dimension. I would say, Professor Sibram, which is you can be permitted, I would like to, you know, uh, take the discourse on different direction with a very limited span of time. You know, we have, as we in some traditional Sanskrit, we have, yes, as you already know, we have four dimensions, four layers of language. The initial dimension that we focused on, that we focus on, is called Vaikhari. From there, if you move on to the inward journey, then becomes the language of Swapna, that is our dreams, that is called. Mm -hmm. Parava, sorry, uh, uh, Parava, one. And then the third dimension comes, uh, that is the Pashantiva. If we take focus, if we uh, focus our attention to what uh, Achar Bhartrihari said in his Bhakti Padi, there are four dimensions Paran, Pashant, Vaitari, Madhama, Para, and Pashant. So the locked dimension of the language. Arvindo said, uh, what I'm trying, I'm just trying to add to what you have said, you know, that is very important how Sanskrit can be instrumental not only in building of Tanskara, but also can be instrumental in our spiritual journey, the cosmic journey, you know, that is starting from Vaitari, we come down to the language of dreams that is called Madhima. And if we boil down, see, you know, if by doing tapa towards the language and towards our own or the building of our Sanskara, we can even boil down to the extent of listening, like Vishyur Mantra Dashtaraha, you know, then from Vaitari to Madhama to Para and finally to Sabda Brahma, that is Pashantiva. 
so i'm sure they accept it like shia window for a uh, for a very mundane you know mundane beings we must have focused on the contributions of sanskrit in building of it, our nation in from the linguistic point of view but definitely there's another dimension like the as per the light dimension is already left that is that remains clandestine that remains you know in stigmatic in the like a mistake that is if we from the linguistic point of view start our journey as we go in the cross to journey by doing tapa language that is especially the sanskrit can be instrumental not mm. only in building our identity as a human being as a, you know and in and as an ideal indian citizen but it can also be instrumental in our cross to journey that is what i try to do so we must also try to do certain research the dimensions which are rest uh you know from the point of view of our local journey that is the journey of our you know building of our personality as an english and as a national as an indian national but also to try to well to figure out and do certain researches what are the messages that are still to be decoded that was why it was just a small observation but one certain i think i proud to say the team of you and dr samdha me shared of simple dynamic for this like that was just a small addition from my yeah. part i'm sorry if i've done if i've said something which is which i without any controversy i was just trying to add from my knowledge thank you very much no. uh tatu i just get in here thank you professor chaturvedi i mean it was a delight to have such erudite people as a member of our audience professor prayas chaturvedi is a senior professor of french at the banaras hindu university and he has grown up in a family of sanskrit scholars so i get professor sampadanan all the such intense discussions just make me feel that we need several more discussions and sessions with professor sampadanan in coming days to have uh, to learn more from him and especially on the french and the sanskrit link that he has initiated today in uh, during this uh, and i really regret going short on time because there was so much to talk on but i mean tato you can take on and i thank thank from my end for for all participation and professor sampadan and especially for this excellent intervention of yours today it's left me thinking on a lot of angles and i hope to have you again with us sometime very soon sir tato please carry on yeah no i mean um uh, in fact um, uh the only feeling that we have after this wonderful discussion today is like we must perhaps take up multiple themes out of this this discussion and create a series of um uh you know uh, webinars or actual physical seminar where we because there are certain things the way you were talking about etymology and other aspects of language that that really demands a much deeper speculation and on this note since we have run out of time i uh, would request my colleague so i'd like to say something please yeah please uh, just before the vote of thanks i'd like to first of all thank everyone for having given us such illuminating lectures in, in spite of the paucity of time and there was something that uh, professor ventication said right in the beginning which greatly interested me which is when she brought together uh, orbindo with the arvar saints and subramanian bhartiya all of that so uh, i just wanted to say that tomorrow uh, the school of humanities is organizing a webinar where we will be talking about the arvar saints the vaishnavism we are talking about oh. krishna and uh, we are also talking about uh, other north indian poets who have written about krishna and we will also be having some uh, people who will be singing what they wrote so when uh, professor venkatesan talked about the arvar saints it uh, immediately i felt you know what a coincidence it was that on the eve of what we are planning tomorrow she's brought it all together like that so thank you very much thanks a lot ma'am for the information and we are really looking forward to this uh, this very uh, enriching session that we will have tomorrow um on uh, you know as ma'am said and now may i now request uh, manasi sir joshi to officially uh, tally for the vote of thanks to the participants please 
Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I stand before you to perform a very pleasant task, the vote of thanks. To speak after Professor Zampadanand Mishra is a challenge, but fools rush where angels fear to tread, as they say. So here I am, my heart brimming with gratitude for today and all those who made it possible. Professor Nageshwar Rao, Vice Chancellor Ignu, your presidential address was inspiring and we are grateful you found a time for us. Professor Kukreti, Pro Vice Chancellor Ignu, your special address was informative and we learned a lot. Thank you for making today possible. Dr. Jayanti S. Ravi, our guest of honor, Secretary, Auroville Foundation, your keynote address set the tone. We had seen you speak and sing on YouTube, but listening to you live in a webinar was something else. Thank you for celebrating Sri Aurobindo with us. Professor Malti Mathur, Director, School of Foreign Languages. Dr. Dipanvita Srivastava, Associate Professor in French, School of Foreign Languages. Professor Vidya Venkateshan, Director, Center for European Studies and Head, Department of French, University of Mumbai. Tato, if I may, Consultant, French, School of Foreign Languages. A big thank you for creating this webinar with all the love and devotion you bear for Sri Aurobindo one of Green India's greatest sons. This is the first time Center for European Studies, Mumbai University and IGNU have joined hands and we hope it is the first of many more fruitful ventures in the future. But we could plan and plot all we like. The success of a webinar is the handiwork of its speakers and we were truly blessed to have with us Padmashri, Professor Michel Danino, author and historian, visiting professor IIT Gandhinagar and Professor Sampadanand Mishra, Dean Culture, Professor and Director, Center for European, uh, sorry, Center for Human Sciences, I'm sorry, uh, Center for Human Sciences, Rishihud University. Professor Danino, nothing is sweeter than your mother tongue and I request the non-francophone to bear with me as I thank Professor Danino in French. So few an honor et un immense plaisir de vous entendre, cher Professor. Votre réputation vous précède de loin. Nous avions beaucoup entendu parler de vous et de vos connaissances encyclopédiques de Professor Venkatesh. Vos écrits, vos entretiens nous ont toujours fascinés. Votre conférence sur la naissance indienne, sur la renaissance indienne et Sri Aurobindo nous a profondément émus. Nous vous en remercions de tout cœur. Professor Sampadanand Mishra, you opened a treasure trove for us today when you spoke about Sri Aurobindo's vision, languages in India and nation building. This aspect of the great master was a revelation. A multifaceted genius, he is beyond labels. But this part of his life and work shows him as a true rishi, a seer, a visionary. Last but not the least, our audience who have been drawn from different parts of the world, you responded to our invitation and in spite of different time zones, you joined in as much as you could. This is the true tribute from the heart to the great guru, Sri Aurobindo. May his blessings abide by us always. Shri Guru Bhyo Namaha. Vande Mataram. Thank you. And um, thanks all the participants, all our technical staff who also made it possible at IGNU. With that, um, wishing you, I mean, wishing to see you all very soon on some other occasion. Uh, we are concluding this session. Thank